Please join me in a salute to the flag. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome to the Board of Selectmen's meeting for July 24th, 2017. We're going to start off number one on the uh, agenda is Oath of Office, full time officer Justin LeDuc. Chief Chairman, thank you again for allowing us to do this uh, on the air so the public can uh, get to meet our officers, especially with the, uh, the newer officers coming into the department. And, uh, it's been a pretty steady pace over the last three years. It's just that time uh, in the agency where we're seeing that turnover. And we've been very proud of the uh, folks that we've been able to swear in and uh, equally as proud tonight. Um, Justin has a little bit of a history. His dad, uh, Jeff, was a former firefighter here in town and also a part-time police officer with us, so it's kind of a special treat for us tonight. So I'm going to ask Shirley Doheny, the assistant clerk, to come up and administer the oath. Justin, come on. person shall be chosen and qualified in your stead. Given under my hand and seal the 24th of July, 19, 2017, Fred Welsh, town manager. If you would raise your right hand, repeat after me. I, Justin J. LaDuke. I, Justin J. LaDuke. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will faithfully and impartially. That I will faithfully and impartially. Discharge and perform. Discharge and perform. All the duties encumbered on me. All the duties encumbered on me. As full-time police officer. As full-time police officer. According to the best of my abilities. According to the best of my abilities. Agreeably to the rules and regulations. Agreeably to the rules and regulations. Of this constitution. Of this constitution. And the laws of the state of New Hampshire. And the laws of the state of New Hampshire. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. Thank you. Chief, uh, Chief Sawyer for this opportunity and uh, I'd like to thank my family for their support over the years and I'd like to thank the town for their support of the police department as well. Thank you. If anybody's here uh, for this, just be glad to take pictures upstairs. The board has a busy agenda. So I'd ask you to step outside and upstairs and finish up there. Thank you. Thank you. Give them a minute to clear out.
Okay. Uh, public comment. <clears throat> Anybody wishing to make public comment uh, may come forward and please identify yourself and your address. And uh, Norman Silberdick, uh, representing the Rational Taxpayers of Hampton. I live at 70 Todd Mill Road in Hampton. I have uh, a couple items I'd like to just present to the board today, and there's no priority of particular order on them. The first of them is this article that appeared last week regarding um, the uh, experience Hampton development and review and analysis of the downtown area. And the comment that really got to me was the um, implication that they'd love to be able to get the million and a half dollars that's in the uh, road improvement fund for use in the downtown area. And uh, that particular Warren article was passed in, in uh, 1998 for the purpose of... Uh, of improving our roads and we've continued to put money into it it's not a million and a half to me and just a shade under me and three right now and the uh, hasn't really been tapped but we continue to put money into it there is a list of roads that are of high priority they've been uh, stratified in terms of their level of importance by the Department of Public Works and I'm sure you've all reviewed those over the years and I think that uh, those should take priority for the taxpayers over what would amount to be a business development project. I further, uh, I mean, it was a shame regarding the fact that that Warren article got passed for the 300000 to look at the downtown area. I'm not against, uh, in fact, I'm very pro-business, but there's so many questions related to what is the downtown area, what should be included, who should be included, what kind of plan there is. You're dealing with uh, various property owners and trying to get them to agree to a plan would be like herding cats. And you really need to have a lot of thought process into that. I don't know what Mr. Nyan has presented for the board to consider in terms of a strategic plan with the cooperation of the merchants that are downtown. Some of those merchants would not be, if the tenants are trying to attract tourist traffic into the community to go to a cleaner, uh, or go to the, to, uh, uh, the drugstore, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure that, that it makes sense. But uh, I would think that the board should put pressure on the group before they spend any money uh, to identify what their strategy is. And uh, right now we're very concerned that money that's used uh, for, um, for these kind of purposes to really develop business in the community be thought out very, very carefully. The second comment I want to make was I had previously written an article in the paper and I had, uh, followed up with emails concerning the cable TV committee because at the time that Warren article was prepared, the lack of uh, identification that there was going to be a reduction of $250,000 worth of revenue to the town to offset taxes resulted in that item being passed. And the, uh, at, the, uh, at the deliberative session, instead of getting 40%, it then went to 100% uh, of the cable TV, cable TV fees. It's far more money than is needed. Um, we had requested that this be reviewed when they had a meeting. I thought that they didn't have a very good, any sense of a strategic plan direction, what they want to use the money for. And it's going to be a surplus in there. And failing to um, to be able to uh, either put the money back into the general coffers, we would suggested reducing the cable TV fee, which would affect all taxpayers from Comcast from 4% to 2%. I know it's to be studied at some point in time in the future, but I'd like to request the Board of Selectmen not to ignore it and to uh, and to take it up for review. Oh, three minutes, so. Am I done? Okay. Well, one last thing. That gas station, which is sitting on uh, at the corner of uh, Lafayette Road and uh, Winnicunnet Road, is uh, I was just curious. The guy wants something like eight hundred thousand, six hundred thousand dollars for it. It's assessed for uh, 
332,000, which is more than the active gas station uh, um, a repair place across the street. And I was so adamant about uh, getting uh, 600,000 that maybe you ought to be taxed at 600,000. Thank you. Anybody else wishing to make public comment? Good evening, my name is Colin Harrington. I live at 6 Haver Lave, Hampton Beach. Uh, I just want to make a couple of comments with reference to Bernie's uh, license. A um, couple of things. <coughs> um, basically, over the last couple of weeks, my wife uh, had to call the police for reasons of noise and of uh, it, uh, a lot of profanities used. Um, <coughs> the latest one was Friday night. Um, my wife went out in the street because she saw a police officer uh, in the street with um, um, a decibel meter. She went over to, to complain to him and he told her that, well, the noise level is only 65 decibels right now. <clears throat> it was after 11 o'clock. She said, well, I believe the ordinance says it's supposed to be 50. And with that, <clears throat> there was some constant barrage of profanities come from this particular song. And my wife asked the police officer, well, you have to listen to this. And he said, well, I believe that's freedom of speech. It is America. So I somehow don't believe that that's how it is. Um, I was shocked to hear that. I was hoping the chief would still be here. Maybe he could answer the question as to why we were given that answer. But this is one of the reasons why I believe monitoring should be a good idea for, for that particular premises. Um, it would help also the pre previous time when the police came they came after the offense, so they came at like 12.15. So how can anything be proven that there was an offense when they were called 20 minutes prior? I know they have a lot of better things to be doing. So if the, if the, the monitoring system was, some kind of monitoring system was in, uh, in place there, it would be easier for everybody to instantly check it. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Anybody else wishing to make public comment? Uh, Patricia Murphy for <coughs> Haverhill. Uh, just a couple of things. Uh, two weeks ago when we were here, uh, scientific evidence was presented to the board uh, pretty conclusively stating that uh, Bernie's could not comply with the 50 decibel sound ordinance after 11 p.m. Indeed, the individual who presented uh, testimony on behalf of Al Fleury, Jim Rose, uh, in his report dated uh, July 10th, also stated uh, specifically that you he could not uh, comply with the 50 decibel limit after 11 o'clock. Uh, and in fact, the police reports or the police um, report that was uh, submitted to the board on July 10th, 2017, uh, indicates that there were three separate occasions. Uh, that the police monitored it, one particularly from Haverhill, which is my street, uh, at 74 to 79 decibels at my street. Uh, so it was clearly over the limit. Um, at best, if the board is going to take this up and issue this license, it should be on a temporary basis, and there should be restrictions as to the uh, dates and times where uh, live music uh, could be had that live music should terminate at 10 p.m. on work nights. That would be Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and on Friday and Saturday nights. I, I don't. I, I would not object if it was to 11 o'clock. But since it, he cannot comply after 11 p.m. with the 50 decibel level, the restriction should be put in the permit, whatever permit is issued. And I'm hoping it's only temporary. Uh, that the uh, that it be limited to live music ending, as I um, just stated. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else wishing? Charlie. <coughs> yep. Uh, Charlie Preston, Clay Path, Hampton. Um, pretty much wanted to talk about the same issue. Um, my dad and well, my family's been at 63 Ocean Boulevard. I think we're in the fourth generation now. I asked my dad last year about Bernie's. He said he didn't see a problem. You know, see you here. I asked him again this year. His response was the same. And I realize 
um, the sound goes straight out and he's, you know, but where his, where his living room is and his bedroom is, his, his apartment, he's 200 feet. And he doesn't, you know, he doesn't see or hear a problem. I am sure he would agree with Colin as far as language. I have no doubt of that. But, you know, the beach is, uh, the nature of the beach, it, it's a tourist destination. It's, um, you know, people got to be a little, you know, there has to be a little mutual tolerance to this whole thing. You know, it's nice to see the seasons come. It's nice to see the seasons go. But the beach provides a, a living to a lot of people, it employs a lot of people. So we all have to put up with, we have to put up with, you know, we have to put up with some stuff. Um, good luck, I know after watching the Chief, good luck to anybody writing and or enforcing a noise ordinance. You know? We all know what noise is, we know what loud is when we hear it, but you, you have everything mixed in down there, and I really think no matter what you do, everybody has to be treated equally. So if it's a, if it's a time, it's a time. But um, hey, we're, we're lucky. We have the beach to ourselves, you know, nine months of the year, ten months of the year. But in the summertime, we have to share it. So I just wish, and I, I spoke at the very first meeting when it was a public hearing, and I said I didn't have a position either way, but I said I just don't want to see people suing, you know, whether it's... Uh, the business suing, or it's the residents suing. It's like we we've got to try to work together. They've tried to do you know a lot of things down there, and you know let's keep going forward with that. Let's let's try to avoid litigation at all costs because the bottom line is when people start suing, it's, it's they're suing us all as taxpayers of this town. So let's let's cool the heads prevail and um, hopefully we'll have a good summer. Thank you very much. Thank you, Charlie. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm uh, Dr. Bruno Battistoli. Uh, I own the property at 6 Bradford Avenue. Uh, I spoke to you um, about a month or so ago. Uh, on June 25th, I uh, attended, I was in town and uh, was here for the Whalers concert um, at Bernie's. Uh, and it started off at a reasonable volume and by about 10 o'clock they were singing in my living room. Uh, I called the police. They were very responsive. They said they had other complaints, uh, and they'd already dispatched an officer with a um, uh, uh, with a uh, DB meter. You know, we're coming down to the home stretch here, and in, in whether or not you approve uh, and extend this license, uh, the as Patricia Murphy wrote to you in a letter, uh, you have the authority to amend that license to restrict the hours uh, based on the uh, on the circumstances. Um, my family's owned for more than 20 years here. Um, we bought because it's a family destination and we rent to families, lots of them. Uh, and we have an open air concert facility on on the roof of one of our buildings that's a block and a half from our house. Uh, it's there, it's probably not going away, but I think Patricia's uh, recommendation and request that you seriously consider ending the entertainment at 10 o'clock Sunday through Thursday and 11 o'clock on Friday and Saturday is a reasonable request for a family destination to allow midnight every night um, it, it's, it just flies in the face of that, and uh, it concerns me as far as our property and the future of the town. So I ask you to seriously consider uh, doing what many towns do, ending the entertainment at 10, uh, Sunday through Thursday, and at 11, Friday and Saturday. Uh, and I'm also concerned, lastly, about the precedent you set with a midnight entertainment license, because I know they're going to be lining up here wanting to extend their licenses to midnight uh, based on the principle of equity. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else wishing to speak? I'm 
Jane Bradley, and I'm at 26 Cliff Ave. And I just want to say that I concur with those who have spoken. Um, I think that there should be a cutoff time of 10 o'clock on weekdays and 11 o'clock on weekends. And I also think if they're not going to adhere to the rules that are set, that something should be done about the fact that it's an open air facility. I really believe that that would solve a lot of the problems if he was forced to put a roof on on his place because there it is the one place in the area that people are mostly complaining about and it should never have been granted in the first place. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else wishing to speak? My name is Frank DePippo. I live up in Boar's Head um, in Hampton. I've lived there a number of years. I've worked at the beach for many years. I worked for the Prestons many years ago, cleaning the picnic tables at one of their spots. I worked uh, cooking food along the beach. And we would go home at night, sometimes getting out from be working at a fryer later. At, you know, we'd go home at 11 o'clock at night, and we'd walk across the bridge to uh, the Hampton Beach side of Hampton, and we wouldn't have any problems with the noise. This is something new that's been accidentally, I believe, in the best interest of being fair, created um, by this body, by the grant of this license. And I would just ask these questions. Um, someone has raised issues with the language of the noise ordinance and said maybe it's not that enforceable. If that's possible, then maybe the um, permit should be revoked until the law is corrected. So that's one thought. Next, if a permit is issued, it should only be, I would suggest, temporary so that there isn't a problem and it can be reviewed month by month with the music stopping at all times at 10 p.m. and all limits under the ordinance be enforced because you can't have them with the profanity that's being reported at a family beach area they're degrading as the taxpayers are considering this they're degrading the area and they're turning it into what you know a Coney Island type form of Salisbury Beach I used to work down there years ago and it was horrible so now you have a situation where this permit is allowing people to play music in the interest of getting customers in and it's causing a problem for people that own property so they're losing property value are you saying to them as select select men and board members come in and get an abatement because bernie we granted bernie's this license get three thousand dollars knocked off your taxes for consideration i'm just saying that and if there are any potential conflicts I don't know what the rules are. There's a town attorney, there's a town manager, and other people. This is rhetorical, but if there are conflicts, people should not, at the end of the day, when the voting is done on this license, I would suggest not be voting on this. I've worked for the city of Boston for a short period of time as an attorney. I was an assistant town attorney. I've never seen something like this happen. It's like somebody accidentally putting a car crushing unit in someone's backyard and then realizing that they're crushing cars and it's making a lot of noise I know everyone here is a very good person but in this case potentially a mistake has been made thank you very much for listening to me have a Anybody good day else from the public wishing to speak yes My name is Jillian Colby, and I'm here on behalf of Valerie and Lawrence Santilli. They the own address was? Uh, 10 Haverhill Avenue. Okay. Um, they've asked me to convey that they appreciate Mr. Fleury's attempts to lower the noise. However, they do echo the concerns that have been spoken about tonight with regard to the content. Um, they found Friday night to be particularly vulgar, um, and they're concerned about that. So they would ask the board in making its decision to consider some kind of monitoring with regard to the content of the music and the entertainment. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else from the public wishing to speak? Okay, seeing none, we're going to move on. Announcements in the community calendar. Um, Regina? 
Yes, uh, the director of Parks and Rec, uh, Ms. Martin, wanted me to say that there will be a ribbon cutting and official opening of the Five Corners Playground. And it will be Monday, July 31st at 5 p.m. if anyone is interested. Thank you. Rusty? Same thing I had. All right, she told everybody. I had the same thing. <laughs> Phil? Negative, sir. Thank you. Rick, nothing? Okay, good. Moving on to the consent calendar agenda. Uh, coin operated amusement devices, license, Seacoast United Soccer Club, Dance Hall Permits, Ashworth by the Sea, Victoria Inn and Pavilion, Wally's Pub, modification of deed restriction, excuse me, 4A and 4B, Atlantic Ave, 911 Ocean Boulevard, parade and public gathering licenses, Global War of Terrorism Monument, rededication 911, Seacoast Century Weekend, 923 and 924, Use of Town Property Electronic Signs for the Seacoast Century Weekend, 923-924. Release of Welfare Liens, Map 143, Lot 12, Map 194, Lot 8, Map 222, Lot 22, and Map 230, Lot 10. Seafood Festival Sidewalk Vendor Licenses, Shirts Are Us, 105 Ocean Boulevard, Bargain World, 235 Ocean Boulevard. I make a motion to move the consent agenda. Second. All in favor? Approved. Okay, we go to appointments. Trustees of the trust fund. Norm, with your other hat on. We need the approval yes. a minute. What's that? We need the approval a minute. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Norm. Hang on a minute. You can sit. Hang on. I just didn't do <laughs> approval of minutes. There was a correction of the minutes that was sent out to everybody. June 26, 2017. Did everybody see that? Yes. Okay. Do I have a motion to accept I'll the minutes as corrected? I'll make that. Okay, all in favor? All right. Unseal minutes of April 23rd, 2013 of a non-public uh, meeting. Okay. Second. All in favor? Okay, that's good, unsealed. Now, appointments. Norm, trustees yeah. of the trust fund quarterly update. Good evening, again. Good evening. Uh, we had a record hit a record high at the end of this quarter. We're at twenty million nine hundred and seventy-two thousand for the real estate fund. The fund increased its portfolio gain of th by three hundred sixty-seven thousand for the quarter. For the one year, June to June, it's a million five. For the last three years, two point eight million, and for the last five years, six point six million. And uh, we're pretty excited about that. And uh, the, the revenue for the town uh, should be, we're projecting 700,000, we're up over last year, but it could be higher than that. In fact, we're running closer to 750, but we'll see what it comes out at the end of the year. And uh, we, there was no major adjustments to our portfolio, although we're getting close to a couple areas where we're going to get to our max amount we can have in any one security due to appreciation. A, a pleasant problem, I might say, to have. Uh, the uh, common capital reserves, uh, roughly around $2 million, at a $19,000 gain for the quarter and uh, 46000 year to year. And the last three months of the Common Trust Fund is uh, we're up about 9000 We have a different uh, strategy there so that we're much more conservatively invested in case of liquidity and the need to get money immediately. So uh, that strategy continues as is. Um, and I also want to let you know that this is my last term. Uh, I will not be running for election again in uh, March. So. Uh, completed nine years, and uh, we'll be leaving feeling pretty good about what we've done in that period of time. So, anyway. Questions for Norm? Regina? Record's high, no questions. And okay. sorry that you're leaving, but you should feel good. You've done a great job. Thank you. Thank you. Ditto. I mean, Brett's doing good. Um, I think you've done a great job. Thank you very much. And uh, maybe you'll reconsider. Well, yeah, there's always that possibility. I'm getting nagged from many other quarters. I can imagine. Yeah. Phil? Uh, 
Mr. Silver, thanks for the report, scintillating results. Uh, and uh, you're well accomplished in your billet. And thank you for your nine years of service. Uh, uh, nobody <coughs> pays more attention to detail than you do, uh, both to the budget and uh, to your opinion on that. And thank you very much. Okay, great. Thank you. No, hang on just one second. Yes. Thank you for the service. I hope that you do run again because you do do a good job. Uh, can you just, without getting into the weeds, because, you know, people sometimes hear you give the report on the real estate trust fund and stuff in there. What, what's he talking about? So if you just very quickly say what the real estate fund is and how it's managed. Okay. it's We have $20,970,000 invested in a portfolio of approximately, um, let me get the breakdown here. Let me just so that the public is totally aware of this. We have our um, approximately in equity funds, we have 9.7 million. We have fixed income funds of 3.6 million, fixed uh, and, uh, and another category of fixed income funds of 7.5 million. And uh, so primarily 40% in, in equity, 60% in fixed income. Some of the fixed income is direct investment. We're not doing through mutual funds. We own the bonds. We're going to hold them to maturity. We bought them, for the most part, at discount. The market can go up and down, whatever reason, and uh, we'll, be, we'll be solid, and we're only holding for five years at the, at the max. Our investment advisor, Bearing Point from Hampton, continues to do uh, stellar performance on that, and... Uh, and my, uh, the board, who tends to be very critical at times on nitpicking certain stocks, have been actually quiet this last meeting. <laughs> so so we're, we're, we have very, it's a very solid portfolio where we're, we're generating about 3.6% uh, rate of return, but it's actually a little higher than that, but because of the appreciation and the actual income against the portfolio it seems to be declining, but it really isn't. It's, it's going up. Thank you. And and you might not be able to answer this, or you might try. How many of the towns in New Hampshire have that kind of a trust fund? There's a few, but not no, not, not many. I mean, we're up there. It puts yeah. us in a very good, solid yeah. position. Yeah. And it's been managed very well. So yeah. thank you very much. Yes. Okay. Well, have a great evening. I know you got a lot of stuff to talk about. So. All right. I'll see you later. Angela Poschini. Am I saying that right? Here. Not here. Request for accessible parking space at 10 Bragg Avenue. Does is there anybody representing this, or Fred? Do you know? No, no contact. She was not able to come for the last meeting. Okay. She was planning on being here, but she's obviously can't make it tonight. So, all right, well, we'll move on. If she comes, we'll come back to it. Uh, Christy Pulliam, Finance Director, Monthly Financials. Good evening. Good evening. I'm here with uh, the June financials. Halfway through the year. These are on the website, and everyone should have got these back uh, July 13th, so a little over a week ago. It's the sixth report, so we're at target is 50%. Uh, the revenue summary will show that... Um, the differences in revenue from 2016 to 2017. Uh, the 2017 revenue continues to run slightly below the target at 49.06% and below the 2016 actuals for June. The month's total income was $736,212. Of that total, motor vehicles came in at $332,257 which is over the month's target by $33,315. The other major contributors to the month's total were payment in lieu of taxes at $120,000, interest on taxes at $8,059, building permits at $19,780, departmental income at $105,421, parking lots at $71,187, and the real estate trust at $50,880. On the uh, expense side of things, you'll see that we are under budget by $987,905, or 4%. In June of 16, the year-to-date expenses were 
and $84, or 3.8% under the month's target of 50%. I know a lot of people see that and their eyes get big, but as you can see, there is a pattern. That's usually how we go into the summer months. And then by September or something, we're down in the 300000 or 500000 to the plus. So um, this is our busy time, as everyone is aware. I will just briefly go through and point out any of the departments or sections that are over the 50% target. Uh, finance is at 50.44 with the, the mainly driven by wages, repairs and maintenance, postage and public notices slash advertisements. The audit is at 72.71%. I spoke with the auditors actually a week ago and the draft audit was uh, almost complete. I also spoke with them again today and it was um, in the final re review process at uh, Plodzik so once they're done there then the draft will come to myself and I believe Fred gets a copy so we can do a review of it so it should be uh, printed very soon is our hope. Legal expenses it, legal expenses is at 122.3 percent the legal department as a whole is now over target at 68.7 percent Outside counsel fees and litigation expense are the two driving factors here. General government buildings is at 50.2% when you include the open purchase orders. The police department um, and the fire department, neither one of them are over target, but I figured since they are large departments, it was still worthy of reporting. Uh, the police department is at 44.5% and the fire department is at 44.7%. Emergency man management is continues from March. It's still at 221%. That's the line item. This is $1,000. And so with that $2,000, uh, the chief is working with Homeland Security to get some revenue to um, offset those costs. Hydrants is at 49.06%. Uh, the second of the semi-annual payment should be coming shortly. In the Public Works Department, cleaning and maintenance is at 65.1%. The line item hired equipment is a driving factor there. Snow and ice removal is at 99.6%. Highways and streets as a whole is at 52.3%. Wastewater treatment administration is at 56.9% when you include the annual purchase order for op uh, for chemicals. When you don't when you do not include that they're at 507 the Public Works Department as a whole is under the but is under budget at 48.6%. Patriotic Purposes is at 61.53%. Town Beautification is at 73.35%. On page 17 and 18, the Warren articles that ha uh, were passed at town meeting, you can uh, start to see some quite a bit of expenditures occurring amongst those articles. Fund 24, uh, the Recreation Fund has a balance of $185,698, which includes beach sticker donations of $9,100 and $14,700 being awarded in scholarships so far this year. Fund 25, the Cable Committee has a balance of $310,838. Fund 26, Private Detail has a balance of $136 thousand eight hundred and thirty eight dollars fund 27 which is the EMS fund has a balance of four hundred ninety four thousand nine hundred and forty seven dollars and the wastewater system development charge charges um, fees collected in 2017 total forty six thousand four hundred fifty one dollars with a balance of one hundred thirty one thousand four hundred nine dollars in that uh, account with the board approving uh, expenditures of $43,100 in March. I also um, just made myself a little note here that I have failed to report on the open purchase orders from prior years in the past, and um, they are down to only 4% being open. So 96% of all prior year purchase orders have been expended. So that is all I had. Excellent. Regina. Um, great job. Thank you. On the expense side, I have no questions, but I just have a couple questions on the revenue side. Okay. Now, you go through and you adjusted quarterly what your adjusted budget amount is. Yes. So I noticed it was two that, I know we didn't formally have a discussion in May because you weren't here, but there was two yes. that were a lot lower that you had to readjust for June. Mm -hmm. One was um, 
real estate trust income. Yep. Which I think Norm sort of explained why on that one. Yes. But the other one was parking lot revenues. Parking that was the, in May. That was parking lot revenues were five hundred twenty-five thousand, and now they're dropping down to five hundred thousand. And is that normally what happens for this month? Um, this is the first year that I've adjusted the budget after the auditors had uh, recommended that. Okay. I have to go back and look at my um, estimated revenues that I do in September for DRA because in September you have to estimate revenues before the tax rate is set. However, when the auditors were here this year, they said that um, they had recommended that we add this new column and that we adjust our revenues as we go along. And so I had asked if it was sufficient to adjust it on a quarterly basis. So. Yeah, and I mean, but it looks like you're pretty much right on. I mean, sometimes yes. we have more revenue, which is a good thing. Correct. But those I, are the only two spots where it's actually gone down from last year. Yeah, quarter. the recreation director is here, so she might be able to comment a little further. But I know that with the weather that they've had yeah. this year, I have noticed that there is a drop in uh, the revenue in the parking lots. Okay. And you can see that, I think, um, well, it's about 50000 in June of 17, it's about 50000 less than it was in June of 16. Okay. So that almost makes up for your 100 right there, you know, right. that it was adjusted by. So those numbers will <laughs> fluctuate, and um, I will readjust them for DRA, which is where it officially counts. Um, those are due September 1, but then when we go to set the tax rate, which is usually the end of October, but usually more in the beginning of November, they allow us to adjust them again. So up until the very last moment, you can't adjust. So by the, then we'll have a firm number on what parking lots oh, are I, out because the context will, will be over. So. I was just, I, that was just my curiosity. Yeah. I was just comparing, and that's what I came across. Thank yeah. you for mm -hmm. explaining. Rusty? I think everything looked good. I just uh, I wish Mr. Sobodek was still here because, as you mentioned, on the, uh, the Fund 25, the cable committee, there's... Three hundred, uh, $310,000 yes. in that. And uh, we have talked to, uh, one of the things the cable committee is doing is is trying to get a picture down the road of what they need to do. And they are working right now on prices of equipment that they need to do. We've also asked the school department to do the same thing. Give us a, a, a an outlook over three, four, five years. What you want, what are you gonna need for equipment? So until we get that back, we can't really talk on that part of it until we, we know what the expenditures are. So other than that, it was an excellent report. Thank, thank you. you. Mr. Bean. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Director, thank you for your report. Uh, and I wanted to get a, a little bit more uh, strategic uh, here this evening with you. And you had sent out an email to the board members, is that correct, on uh, uh, a bond amount? Yes, for the one for a one million dollar bond. Yeah, could you explain that uh, uh, for the public, and uh, could you explain that to the board, please? Yeah, I was um, asked to calculate the cost um, at the current interest rate. What a one million dollar bond, the cost related to it in regards to interest would look like. So I had sent out an email. First, I had attached what we had just received from the New Hampshire Municipal Bond Bank because they had just had their bond sale in July, and it broke down the different interest rates that they received for um, bonds. And their five-year bonds, they received an interest rate of 1.76. The 10-year was 2.34%. The 15-year was also 2.34%. 20-year was 2.67%. 25 at 3.15%. And 29 at 3.33%. What I had uh, generated for the board and emailed out was a $1 million bond. Uh, interest cost on a 10-year um, term at the 2.34% is what I, I used what the bond bank just sold at. It was $128,700. On a 15-year bond at 2.34%, the interest rate cost was $187,200. And on a 20-year uh, $1 million bond at 2.67%, the cost was $280,350. Uh, so that would be additional above and beyond the million, of course, because you have to pay back the million, too. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we, we do have uh, uh, some state reps in here. We have a busy agenda, but I just wanted to, uh, again, uh, look at that. There was a PowerPoint presentation. I, of course, serve as a, a legislator. Uh, and we're talking about the state park. Uh, Mr. Cushing was uh, uh, just uh, uh, interviewed by New Hampshire Public Radio. Um, there's been some dissatisfaction with that. And when we look just strictly from the meter transfer 
down at the beach, which used to be our beach, just the meter transfer alone, forget the operational costs, forget meals and rooms, uh, and we look at our exigent needs in this town. If we look at a million dollars uh, on a 20-year note at 2.34, uh, that's uh, $90,000. So some people have said this is hogwash and we need to uh, um, cooperate more with the state. I would say the state needs to cooperate more with us. That's our beach. And if we went 16 times that, 16 times that million, okay, that would be uh, what we are transferring alone. In other words, what we transfer to the state just on the meters in this state would be $16 million, and those meters alone would pay for it. We have a police force, we have a parks and rec. So you can see that our infrastructure needs, you can see the money that the state's taking, uh, and anyone that opposes that really needs to have a sit down, and I'll be happy to sit down with anybody on that. Uh, we're taking that, that issue up to the state. Uh, there are some uh, uh, vacancies on a commission that oversees all of the state parks, and uh, New Hampshire uh, needs some Hampton representation on that. When you look at these kind of uh, opportunities that we are forsaking, and I want to thank you for that and the fine work that you've done there. And then when you go to the New Hampshire State Park website this evening, and, and Rick has just looked at it, you've got Mount Centipede, which is leased by a private corporation. When you go to the New Hampshire State Park uh, website, it's Mount Centipede in the middle of summer. And they've, of course, got their, their winter operations. But Hampton is not on the website okay. for the New Hampshire State Park System. And Rusty's laughing. Uh, and the insults go on and on and on. And those that say we should uh, cooperate more and that this this solid financial assessment uh, is ludicrous um, really need to do some uh, financial training and look at what it's costing this town. This junior high school that's $24 million could substantially have been paid for just for meters. And uh, I say again that there's room for uh, improvement up there for a, uh, a fight. For revenue in this town uh, we're doing some other things there but when you actually talk and I would encourage Max to do some financial reporting just on this issue that you have put on a loan director and uh, uh, we have got uh, two representatives in here tonight that are uh, are working with other agencies on other exigent issues that um, are grappling with agency heads and I won't speak for them but uh, the the role of small government when we're producing this revenue that you have provided the, the, the numbers for are stark, and uh, we are impoverished uh, to the real standard of the revenue that we could bring forth to benefit ourselves, our standard of living, education opportunities for our children, and these type of numbers uh, dwarf what the $20 million that sits in our real estate trust fund brings in, which is about $700,000. So uh, the battle goes on, uh, knowledge is power, and uh, we need a more sophisticated look. And the data that you bring outside of your monthly financials in this type of cooperation is very, very important. Thank you, Director. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Rick? No, but thank you very much. I enjoyed your report. It's great, as always. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank uh, you. I can ask questions, too. Oh, you can? I can, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm People ready. getting up. A <laughs> um, couple of things. Uh, revenue for, for motor vehicles still coming in higher, right? Yes. Yeah, that, which is surprising because they say motor vehicle sales are down, but we're still doing better, There right? was a line the other day, I noticed. Right, so keep the our downstairs was crazy busy. Building permits still up? Yes. That one, it was down a little bit, I think, last month. Even though I wasn't here, I believe it was down a little, but it's back up. Okay. Now, departments that are over, like you said, legal expenses of 122.3%, yep. yep. you keep them apprised a, a of that, right? That yep, every, over? Um, every department head gets uh, just their section of these financials. Okay, okay, and you keep an eye on them that, yep. that, so they're not going to go too far over and it's not going to mess up the budget? Yes. And then you use initials all the time, DRA is what? The Department of Revenue Administration. Okay, I'm just because sometimes the public, you know, when we say initials, they're like, what, what are they talking yeah. about there? So thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you for letting me ask questions. You're welcome. <laughs> um, next, Diana Martin. Good evening. Good afternoon. Evening. Good evening. <laughs> so
So I'm here tonight for some donation acceptances and approvals for some work that I'd like to do. So our toddler park down at Tuckfield is the smaller playground that we have at Tuckfield. And um, that needs some surfacing repair and the cost to repair it is a little bit higher than what I had anticipated last year when I was preparing this year's budget. So I've been looking for some donations to help with the cost of that to, to add to the money that we have in the budget for the toddler park because we did have some money in there to replace some of the surfacing of the playground. But the wood that's on the outside of that playground has rotted and now the surfacing is disintegrating too so we need more surfacing than we originally thought we needed. So um, local sports has come to us and said that they would donate $2,500. So I was hoping that I could get a vote on that to accept that donation to complete that project. And then we're also rapidly running out of storage space in, for the parks equipment that we have. So I'd like approval to knock out one of the windows in the Eaton Park concession stand. We haven't used that concession stand as a concession stand in at least three years. Um, and we've been storing stuff. Part of that stand was for storage and the other part was for food. Um, service and we've been using all of it as storage for the last few years anyway so one of the windows is rotting on the side of the building so we were hoping to um, replace that window with an overhead door so that we could put some of our equipment in there some of our smaller type equipments in there um, so we have a, a quote from the overhead door company of Portsmouth in the amount of $1,325 to do that work and we also have an anonymous donor that would like to give us that amount of money so that we could um, make that work. So I think that this is a, an inexpensive fix to a problem that we have that's ongoing so that we don't have to leave any of our equipment outside. So I'm hoping to get approvals to okay, do that so work. The approval for the donation is for the $1,000 or I'm asking for an approval for a donation of $2,500 from local sports for the playground. Okay. And also approval for $1,325 to to build a door where a window was in the okay. E Park concession stand and okay. to do that work. And the donation from local sports, will that cover the work? At, or, 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 yeah, because I want to add it to money that I had already put in the budget for the that. toddler park in Kids Kingdom. I'll make the motion. Motion by Regina, seconded by Rusty. I just want to ask, what is Loco Sports? I don't know. They're a company that runs road races and bike races. They do, um, <coughs> like, nose. what's that? They do Smutty Nose, don't they? They do the Smutty Nose road race that's in June. They also are the guys that do the um, Rock Fest down at the beach and the Half at the Hanfins. Those are all road races that they run that are here in town. They do races all around um, the seacoast. So what's the Rock Fest? Rock Fest is there's a half marathon and a 5K and it's down at the beach. I think it runs by your mm -hmm. your facility. So is uh, that's the one that's always cooperated with us? They're excellent. Not the one that was from Rhode Island? No, no, no. They're, no, they're from Newmarket, New Hampshire. They're excellent and they've got it down pat. Okay, thank you. Yep. Anybody else? Okay, all in favor? Good. You're all set. Well, Perfect. What? I want the motion for the oh, you need another motion for the for second the, one. Uh, anonymous donation. Of okay. Yep. So 1, I'm one thousand one thousand three hundred twenty-five dollars to do the work and to put in a door in the concession stand so and accept the donation. Second. Second. Rusty. Regina. All in favor? Approved. Thank you Perfect. very much. Thank you. Anything thank else? You. Yeah. Thank you for announcing oh. the. Yes. I, I have a question. Yes. Unrelated. Okay. There was an email sent about Place Cove, the beach. Yes. And about all the signs. Yes. Did you see that? They I have said not pictures. seen this email, no. Okay. It was just about the, the plethora of signs at the beach down there that just... In the past 10 years, the board has instructed us to put all those signs out. All those signs. <laughs> so I'm yeah. totally against signs. Uh, all right. <laughs> okay. Uh, the only sign that I that our department puts out is the no lifeguard on duty sign. Okay. All right. This, there's a whole bunch. The other thing is, while you're here and while Fred's here, the stairs, the access to, and, and I know it's very hard to do, but that, that's the only access that people have that's right. to Place Cove, whereas, you know, at the North Beach, they've got the ramp and they've got by the fish houses that can go down there. They can only get down there. And they've done work on it and made it fairly safe, but then the last step, and I know it's the tide, yeah. 
but is there any way we can do anything about that? I don't know off the top of my head, but I can certainly can discuss. Can you take a look at it? Yeah, I'll certainly look at it and, and discuss take a look that. At it and with see. Because you know that a lot of people just have a dip that might have a mobility yep. problem that have a difficult time getting down to the beach there, and there's no other access there. Right. So yep. if you could do that, yeah, I would definitely Chris is here too. So. Yeah, Chris is here too. He'll take care of it. Yeah, right. I'll discuss it with him. <laughs> <laughs> and I just wanted to say thank you for announcing the um, ribbon cutting celebration that we're going to be having for the Five Points Playground on Monday night. We're just hoping that um, everyone from the community comes out. We're going to have some light refreshments and a really short presentation. And hopefully, everyone will come out and play on the playground. It's, and the Great playground player. is beautiful. It is. A lot of I see it go by there all the time. So yeah. a lot of people using that, enjoying it. Well, I'm just going to throw it out there. I'm probably going to do one on Lock Road next year. <laughs> All right. Super. All right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Chris Jacobs, DPW Director, Bicentennial Park. Good evening, folks. Uh, Duncan Malore is here with me from Time and Bond. Uh, we're here to present the uh, Bicentennial seawall like a progress report uh, to get your input to get uh, start to get the input of others uh, as we would proceed forward to the final design um, this is really just a preliminary design um, hopefully to get um, some feedback and some input from the board uh, I do have to say that um, Jennifer Hale apologizes for not being here um, she's had uh, uh, family obligation or, or issue come up um, and apologizes for not being here. Her plans were uh, to be here uh, with you or with us. Um, with that, you uh, need to pass one. That was called totally whispered that. Yeah, hey, you whispered. You could hear it all the way up here. Nice whisper. <laughs> I don't know why we do such things, but anyhow. The, um, for members that are watching at home, um, there, we are also presenting this same package of information to the uh, Conservation Commission because as we get ready to start the permitting process through the state and the fed federal government, uh, we need their import or concurrence, uh, or at least a letter of support. Also, we thought that we would go to the planning board uh, with the project as a way of um, reaching out to the community to get any uh, input that uh, we we can get uh, with that, Duncan. Yeah, just uh, walk you through, give you an overview here of an aerial photo showing the bicentennial park uh, with the volleyball, the volleyball area behind the seawall and the beach in front of it. Uh, another view gives you a bit of better perspective of the concrete seawall we're talking about, uh, 300 feet long. What we found last fall was the seawall is, is bearing on just sand, on the beach sand, and it had very shallow embedment, only about one to two feet of embedment into the sand. So we were very concerned that the seawall would fall over last winter. Uh, you can see here the safety fencing up behind the seawall to keep people away from it in case it was to fail. And this is a view from last December where you can actually see here in the photograph the footing of the seawall is actually exposed. So it really did get quite close to being uh, all the sand being eroded all the way down to the bottom of the wall. Uh, you're aware that we went out there last uh, January and we did some emergency stabilization by placing a rock revetment in front of it. Uh, we excavated down and set geotextile and then set the stone on top of it. And it is the intent that this will become part of the permanent repair uh, to once we get the rest of the sa seawall stabilized. This is the uh, current status of the plan view for the seawall. Um, one of the things we're looking to do in the overall big picture here is to bring the seawall up so the height of the seawall matches the adjacent state seawall, uh, approximately two, two and a half feet higher than what's out there now. Um, you've probably seen it during storms or the waves over top this wall on a regular basis and erode the sand behind it. Uh, one of the things we want to do is raise it up, and, but a concern we heard was potentially blocking people's view of the ocean. Uh, that's one of the reasons they go out there is to see the ocean. Uh, so what we came up with for a concept cross-section is actually to put a walkway behind the seawall. So that walkway would also be two feet higher than where the sand level is now. 
so that people could walk that walkway and maintain their view of the beach. Uh, it would actually incorporate seating walls on both sides. So the wall on the ocean side is two feet above the top of that walkway, so it's a comfortable place to sit. Uh, we're proposing a railing on top of it. On the inshore side, we've got another low wall there, and we envision that would be a seating wall for people watching the activities going on on the park. So if there's a volleyball game, you could sit along that wall and watch the volleyball game. Uh, but some of the uh, fu uh, practical functional aspects of this is that it protects the backfill of the seawall, so when those waves do overtop it, there's not just sand there that's going to erode and allow the wall to fail. So we're somewhat armoring the area behind the seawall to help prevent that possible failure. Um, it also will assist in storm cleanup. So when seaweed and rocks and so on come washing over the top of this wall during a storm, it would be easier for Chris to go out there and clean it up and then he'll have a hard surface he can run along with a machine and, and scoop all that up. So a lot of considerations in looking at this. Um, the engineering details, we're starting to work those out. The state at seawall that's adjacent is on sheet piling that bears all the way down to bedrock. And that's what we're showing here. It's really not that far down, about 12 to 18 feet down to bedrock. Um, so we are looking to put new steel sheet piling in there to ensure that this wall does not fail in the future. Uh, you know, we did have that concern about the existing wall. You know from being out there, the beach can change profile all the time. It's normal that the sand goes out in the winter and then comes back in the summer. It's usually those winter events when we might lose the seawall. Uh, so this will guard against that. Uh, what we'd like to start getting input on is what does the top of this wall, the visual, visual portion of it, actually look like? Uh, so again, as Chris mentioned, we're reaching out now uh, to the public and to you to see, for instance, on the railing, uh, you know, what type of railing would you like to see out there? Uh, we do want to make sure that it's a good durable railing that's going to stand up to storms, but we also, it's an aesthetic issue, and so we do want to get some input on that. Some other things we might look at on the concrete, you know, do you want to have, for instance, on those seating walls, uh, maybe a granite cap on top, so there's a granite surface you could sit on, or we could go with something like a, an Ipe uh, hardwood that would be a, a nicer, uh, warmer thing to sit on. Top, on. Uh, so those sort of practical aspects on how we'd look at this. Um, in plan view, we are incorporating a curve on the eastern end of this. If you've been down there, a lot of times at the end where the beach access ramp is, there tends to trap seaweed. As that seaweed rots, it gets kind of stinky. So we are looking to incorporate a curved uh, corner on that end of the seawall to help allow that seaweed to pass and continue washing down the shoreline and not get trapped in there. Um, we think the aesthetic of the curve will also be nicer for users of the park. Uh, the other end, we are since we are two feet higher, we are going to have to incorporate a ramp down which would provide access to the parking lot and bring the walkway back down to the elevation of the state walkway. Uh, we have spoken with DREAD and they've indicated that they don't have any plans to do any near-term upgrades, for instance raising their sidewalk up uh, to address sea level rise. Uh, so we, we, at this point we'll have to meet the elevation that they're at right now. Questions for the board? Regina from the board. I don't know. I don't have any questions right now. Rusty? No, I think it's, it's a good plan. We need to, we obviously, we need to do something with that wall, but we also got to make sure, you know, it's nice to have all these seats and everything in it, but what's the cost of it's going to be? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, great uh, initiative, great uh, creativity. Uh, that's a beautiful, beautiful park, and it's been uh, sadly neglected, and it's been uh, quite dangerous. So thank you, Director. Thank you for stepping up on that, Mr. Welch. Uh, like the, uh, the concept of the, uh, um, as you call it, the additional revetment stone, that uh, the, my, my grandkids are all over it, and it, it really is much more aesthetic, and I know it's going to preserve the wall just as the state has got it down there. So I would, I would uh, assume that's going to be a, a definite for the incorporation. The state accesses their repair of the state seawall uh, every uh, several years uh, using uh, this part of the beach right here, as we all know, it's right down here, and they use that. So we'd be looking uh, for you, Director, and you, uh, sir, to uh, make liaison with them to share in some of the costs uh, as they will be uh, using that. That's their primary source. It is uh, highly uh, erosion uh, prone. Uh, again, we've talked a little bit earlier about their, their revenue take out of this town. And uh, I would like to see, I don't speak for the board, but a substantial contribution for them to contribute um, to that, that specific part and uh, uh, look to them for the uh, battle rhythm of the uh, wall replacement every year and how that how that gets into a close integration with them both in terms of maintenance 
uh, reconstruction and uh, a capital contribution uh, on this project. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Director. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Rick? Um, it's certainly long overdue. It's something that needs to be done, and um, I think it's something that everyone's looking forward to. I like the idea of the curve at the end, and um, good luck. I hope it's, we're doing all the right things. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I like the I like the idea that you're asking for input from people on what it should look like because the seawall itself, the state seawall, you know, is, it protects the beach, protects the road very well and stuff, but it's not a very eye appealing wall at all. Right. And that part of the beach there is well used by people year round. There are people down there using that, sitting there behind the wall and everything else, and it's a beautiful, beautiful area. And I like the idea that we're going to do something with the wall. It might cost a little more, might not cost a little more. I think we can investigate it, but that'll have some visual appeal to it also. I mean, down at the main beach, you have the wall with the railing, and it's got a visual appeal. Whereas, you know, all along North Beach, it's just that cement wall, and it's just cement, cement, cement. So I, I really like that idea, and I love, really like the idea that you're going to look for input from people, and there's a lot of in people that spend a lot of time down there. So you really should try and get input from the, the public down there. I think they're important. Hey Jim, I got one yeah, question. Go. Sorry. Why? Why? And I should have brought it up earlier. Why? Why are you talking about this? The drainage is in that area that the state has. It's been damaged. The other floor. Are they? Uh, are, they are they stepping up to to fix that? Are they? Yeah. Uh, we, we reached out to uh, Kevin Russell, is the local engineer, uh, inspecting engineer, and also Brian Shook, S H U T T is his last name. He's at Division Six. This, what Rusty's referring to, Mr. Bright, I should say, Rusty's uh, fine. is there's an out concrete outfall here. This is all concrete pipe with a concrete mass at the end that had had um, they looked like uh, cast iron uh, a flapper is the best thing I can describe it. The cast iron's gone. The concrete's shot. The pipes all pulled apart. It is obvious that what it is is the drainage. Um, the, for the state's catch basins out here that outlets this way. Uh, put them on notice that it needs to be done through verbal communications and written communications. Um, Brian Shutt is trying to put this in his uh, 27, 2018 uh, capital improvement plan. They're on, a, they're on a, uh, June to July, so they're already in their 17, 18 season. Um, but that this needs to be done uh, on their dime at their cost, uh, meeting, if you will, my my uh, my standards. Um, because if it gets plugged with seaweed, I'm going to be the one that uh, knowingly is going to have to come down and do something uh, to, you know, let's say it's uh, early on a Friday morning. It's going to be a great beach weekend. They may not be have the capability to respond, but I know sometimes the call comes to us. One of the reasons um, that we came up with, and this is to address, um, someone made the comment, you know, uh, the additional concrete. Can you go to the cross section? Yeah. Please. When we were looking at this in, in one of our design meetings, um, Ty and Bond had already recognized that we needed to put in possibly a concrete uh, sidewalk on the back side of this so that when there's a splash over, it doesn't erode this sand and thus erode um, the uh, seawall. A number of seawall failures are not due to, if you will, being eroded here. They're actually caused by being eroded on the back side. Then when the wave action hits it, it actually tips the wall backwards. So that was the reason for that. When we were having that discussion, the, the next logical thing came up and said, well, I suggested why don't you put a curb on the back side to take this water and channel it. We can grade it so it's channeled left or right and not right over the the uh, right over the seawall. Also, it would allow me to move the with my sweeper and um, our crews in the morning better maintain this, especially if there's debris. Then the other idea was, well, why don't we instead of just making it a curb, why don't we make it a full width seating? So that people using the volleyball area right here, and uh, Diana can tell you, there's a lot of uh, activity there during this during afternoon <coughs> nights for the volleyball. And yes, during the morning, uh, everybody who's um, I, I know they've got a, a unique name, but it's the crowd. Walnuts. Huh? Walnuts. 
<laughs> That's why I didn't remember that name. <laughs> the crowd that gathers, the walnuts that gather down here, I knew that they needed better access. Uh, if if uh, where the chairs go, um, I know there's a couple of handicapped spots there, and there's a number of people that are, are probably using wheelchairs that would also want to come and look at the, the ocean. This would give them everybody who would be ADA accessible and everybody would get the chance. So uh, if someone who wants to visit here, grandkids can play here, you know, it just it becomes more of a multi-use space. So it isn't just strictly a wall, uh, a concrete slab. You know, all of this definitely needed to be in, but it's this portion here. And, and while we're here to get your, your thoughts, um, that make this more of an amenity than just a structural piece of concrete. So, so. if anyone was wondering, we are leaving the majority of the seawall that's there now in place, uh, cost-wise. Uh, it costs money to get rid of it. It would cost money to jackhammer it out of place. But we are taking off about the top three feet of it. And uh, most of the she sheathing will go in right behind it. And if you could back up two photos, maybe, yeah. This section here of the seawall that's the roughest, it's also not in line with either this wall or that wall. That is being removed in full. And uh, what we're going with here, um, this is going to have a peak elevation here of uh, 14. Not that that matters to it. And we have 745 down here and 11.3 here. Continually, I'm having to go down, um, especially prior storms, and you see the fun-looking Jersey barriers and that pile of stone that looks like an afterthought. The hopes there are that by making this ramp come up and over and then back down that I wouldn't, uh, it's going to minimize our risk to uh, sea flooding coming up through there. I'll probably still have to do something on an annual basis, especially for the big storms, but at least it won't look as obtrusive as it uh, does now. That's it. Any other comments? Um, so are there any other drains uh, like that one that drain from the boulevard to the ocean? Because there only, are some. There's two some. other that I know of. One's at Haverhill Lab and a little further down, a little south from Haverhill, because the state dug those up a couple of years ago. And there's one like at right around... Uh, Shaw. There's one at Shaw, too. Yeah. But there is one that's uh, just south of Boar's Head. Okay. Uh, because you can see the when the waves break, you can see it moving back and forth. Okay. Uh, it's about two or three blocks south of Boar's Head, about uh, where Dick Roy's condos are there, the timeshare. It's about where uh, Breakers by the Sea, kind of opposite that. Hmm. And I saw the state working on it. They did fix it this year. Hmm. Okay. And the, the road was closed for a while. That's what brought my attention to it. So I'm wondering, you know, are they planning on, are there others? Or why aren't they putting all the drains that don't work into their capital budget? <laughs> <laughs> that I don't have. Well, that's something we need to be working on. And there's going to be a meeting on Thursday night about flooding, is there? Green Street is Thursday night. And where is that at? Here? That is here. So is it just for the people at Green Street? Yes. Because the solution and problems are different than, let's say, for the people that are off of Brown Ave. With that meeting is the following week at the police station. Same evening, Thursday evening. Because theirs is a radically different solution. Yeah, because I maintain that some of those drains that don't work on Ocean Boulevard, they're, the water that doesn't get drained off drains down and makes their problem even worse on Street, Street and Kings Highway. A bit different. And uh, that's all I have about that, but I have something else I want to ask Chris about. Yeah, just one, one last comment on this, Rick, if yeah. I may. Uh, and again, going back to that bond issue that we talked about, this is a beach issue. Uh, if you look at uh, Christina's uh, um, handout that went to the, to the board, if you do a 20-year bond, the annual payout on the high end is 76000 That $1.6 million meter transfer, just the meters, which is net profit, just on the meters, uh, bonds $20 million of capital projects. Uh, and we pinch pennies, and that shows you in just a very small fraction of what leaves here, and that's just for the meter transfer, just for the meter transfer, and then we struggle and we pinch pennies, and we let 
assets depreciate and, and become dangerous to this extent, and then we uh, we pinch pennies. But again, uh, that money just on the meters is a twenty million dollar bond. The seventy six thousand dollar payout, and the math is simple. And for those that don't get it, um, anybody wants to talk to me, I'll be happy to share it with you. And so on, Christy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Chris, you have something about, about trees? Trees. Can we have you? Oh, yeah. I sent forth a memo, uh, seven copies. I'd hoped that it would be on next week's agenda because it should be. I know there's residents of Academy Ad that wanted to attend. Um, the coring results showed that some of the trees should be removed. Uh, but I thought that you'd want to do that uh, in a public hearing. Okay, so you, you'll bring that to us next week for the next uh, meeting? I submitted it and asked that Mr. Welch's privilege uh, and your privilege to be on the agenda at your convenience. The problem Chris has is he wants to do this before school starts. Oh, yeah. He hasn't scheduled it. You don't meet again for two weeks, so it's going to be sometime in August. It's almost going to be when school starts that, that he, he's going to schedule it after school starts. And that's one of the reasons I wanted him to bring it up to you tonight. Okay. So the, the short of it is a number of them had uh, core thicknesses 13, 12 and 13 inches. So when you look at the report, there's a number of core thicknesses that are 5 inches, 4 inches, 3 inches. Those are the trees that are, as uh, it's been described to me, or Fred's used the term, red-hearted, meaning that the uh, center mass is more pulpy. Uh, the explains to me the coring process that if the if the core can't bite, it means he's into unsolid wood. So there's uh, definitely, uh, I believe it's trees. It's in the memo. Five trees. Five trees, right? There's three of them that I classify at risk, and two that definitely need to come down. Um, I have the money in, in the budget. Um, this is what I believe Mrs. Parker and a few other. People along Academy Ave were questioning. Uh, my other concern, and I didn't raise it in the memo because I really don't know uh, and won't know till Wednesday, the plans of the school. I know that they're ready to demolish one portion. Um, started today. Okay. My concern is that I'd be in the way at some point. And then, of course, with the trees. So you need permission from us to proceed? Yes. 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 And you'd like it to be given tonight, if that's possible. If he, because he does not want to be doing this at the same same time the constructing the school and opening school. Yeah, It'd be a bad schedule. I'll make a motion that we uh, we take down the five trees that I mentioned. Okay. Um, I think uh, we, we've talked about these before. Somebody had said that they were they were mem memorial trees, but talking to people that lived on that street, nobody can remember who they were memorializing um, and it, looking back and checking on it we can't find that they were actually planted as memorial trees right. so if they are a danger let's get rid of them let's reduce the liability to the town okay. can Second. we make a motion to uh, plant five new ones of course sure we can add that to it yes let's do okay. that well let's take the first or as part of the motion you want to put part of the motion we will, we will replace those with not necessarily pine trees. Yeah, I have a list of trees from the arborist, uh, the suitable trees, and we'll just expand that. Perfect. I'll second that motion. Okay, all in favor? Unanimous. Good. Thank you. Thank you. And I have the, uh, oh, the letters Rick has I want something. to ask him about. These two letters came um, since we met the last time, and they focus on public health um, and public safety. So I'm going to read them both. They're both short letters. Um, one of them is, I believe, Chris's uh, answer or opinion. Dear Mr. Welch, I'm passing along some photos of Gurney's Beach Bar that I'm hoping you can forward to the appropriate department heads to find a solution to the garbage situation. Thank you. This is what a typical weekend morning looks like at Gurney's. The owner and operator has created a fantastic venue, but it has some come at a substantial price to the neighborhood on L Street. Furthermore, unless some very smart people get involved, this problem will not likely have a solution as the building takes up 100% of the lot. There is no room to put all these barrels <coughs> where they are out of the public right-of-ways. <coughs> you must 
admit it was not the original intent of the town to pick up such a large amount of trash in individual totes. This is clearly is something a dumpster should be handling. Their issue is destruction of public property. The concrete is covered in kitchen slum, walkway not ADA accessible, feeding ground for rodents. It smells and the totes are covered in kitchen slum. As of this year, L Street is finally free of its heroin house. Now we have to contend with this. At the very least, they should be required to bag everything, clean the barrels, clean the sidewalk, get a screen door going into the kitchen from the sidewalk, or are they going to get rodents walking in? Then the next letter is <coughs> Fred. When I first visited Bernie's last summer, the decision was made to limit him to 27 containers of both types. In the photos, I count 16 to 17 containers. Per the planning board approval, he was to keep the containers beside the back of the structure. Later, last summer, due to a concern raised by Nabutter, we met on site, fire codes and PW, and we agreed that he could keep the containers below the structure. Al stated that his staff would move them in and out prior to and after unloading. It ha I had doubts at the time if it would really work, occur, because it is labor intensive. And someone would actually have to care to do the job on a timely basis and thoroughly. I see this as a situation, I see this situation as a building inspector code enforcement issue. I also believe that this should be tied to the entertainment license that is issued seasonally to the operation. And, you know, it's uh, very clear from pictures that we have here that have been submitted that um, the sidewalk is not accessible to wheelchairs. Mm -hmm. And it's not accessible to wheelchairs as of 5 to 6 this evening because I was down there. And the trash has been picked up, and it's very clear. And there's at least, I don't know, probably about 20 barrels all lined up. And I know that it wasn't in the intention. I've worked, we've worked on trash here all the time of all these years. And it's never been in the intention that the people should be able to leave their trash cans out and not put them back out of sight. Now, I have uh, checked this out since I looked at the first man's letter. I went down there every morning this week. And I've checked it when the trash picks it up. <clears throat> and uh, not only did I check this establishment, I checked every other establishment in Hampton. And um, on after Friday night or Saturday morning, um, and I think that the, the areas, the building, the ones that I checked are like the big five, Bernie's, the Sea Catch, the Boardwalk, um, and Wally's. Uh, and basically there's some others. Um, it's kind of interesting to look because it really are those, those are the four big ones. Mm -hmm. And uh, there aren't other people, and I checked them also today before I came to this meeting. No one else leaves the bill. The, uh, all of the other barrels are all out of sight. Mm -hmm. So they've removed them. They've put them somewhere. Um, I'd like to know why you're allowing these barrels to sit there. Or what, what do we have to do to make sure they don't sit there? I mean, the biggest problem I have, which anyone can see, is this trash. This trash is this way right at this minute right. is like this. Not only that, furthermore, when I went down today, the goat, um, there are t almost 20 barrels there that are just sitting there, and um, they're not in any way uh, removed from the sight line. Now, this is a tourist area. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know, uh, has the planning board just allowed these barrels are supposed to just stay there within eyesight of everything all the time? Or are they supposed to put their barrels somewhere where they're not supposed to be seen? I mean, that's a unique situation because there's no, like, back of the building because the back of the building's on Ashworth Avenue. Yeah. The front of the building's on another street. But, you know, we get 
ca we've changed the law here for the regular citizens of Hampton this year uh, and made it so that we lift the restrictions because walls, uh, fences had to be three feet before and we changed it to four feet so other people that live in homes could make it so that their barrels are not visible. Mm -hmm. Now how are we allowing this to be this way? When you, when we are appointed as one of the best uh, boardwalks or the best boardwalk that's in the United States, I guess, um, when you're walking down that boardwalk, you see this area. Mm -hmm. And if that door was open, I would definitely see it's a problem. Also, this is this way at Bernie's today, too, when I just came. It's all of the boxes are all probably in the process of being broken down. But how does how do we get some relief for the people that live around? It, it's just not... Uh, it's not acceptable mm -hmm. that these neighbors that live around here, um, and I could go on and on, I think the biggest thing I learned when I went down all these mornings is that everybody follows the rules. Uh, I was, um, I, ha I have pictures, I have taken more than a hundred pictures, and most of the pictures, I have good pictures. Uh, someone like uh, Christie's Pizza Place, they have a little barrel. They don't have one bit of trash on the ground. The trash that blows out of here fills up the garage of the motel that's across the street where um, their balconies of their vintage hotel look down into these barrels. It's disgusting. I just don't understand how this could even be allowed. And if the town won't do anything about this, won't the state do something about this? It's obviously a health hazard. And so I'm saying if the town won't do anything, what, what, what else is going to be done? Um, I was uh, approached by people out there. They saw me taking the pictures. I took the pictures at a different time every day. I went at 5.15 one morning. I went at 6 o'clock another morning, and I went at 6.30 another morning. Um, the swill that's on the sidewalks is it's excruciating when the garbage truck is there, because I was there when the garbage truck was there. The lady that's renting rooms across the street, if their doors were open, the smell is unbelievable. Hmm. And uh, there is vomit on the streets in front of some of these establishments. <clears throat> And it's, you can see it. The pictures are here. They do not lie. One of the biggest problems I have is that the barrels are not uh, even closed. And uh, also, I suspect that the barrels are being moved between Bernie's and the Wally's. Because when I went down there Friday, there were many more uh, barrels at Wally's. When I went down there today, Wally's was the star of the show this morning. It was clean and everything was perfect. Mm -hmm. But there weren't as many barrels that were there on Friday. So I just think there's a problem here. I don't think anyone's uh, doing anything about it. I, I say, do we need code enforcement? Is that what it's going to take? The, as far as, um, un, there are a number of things here. Um, as far as within my authority and jurisdiction it was to determine the number of barrels and, and yes we work with uh, businesses and residents alike that um, you know the ordinance clearly states that all the refuse has to be in the containers um, if it's not yes we do send uh, Frank Swift our foreman by or one of the other foremen to you know to work with the individual property owners um, the with respect to the carts staying out on the, the sidewalk 24-7 um, we have worked with businesses in the past to in apartment complexes and residents that they need to become be taken in off the street uh, after they're, they're emptied in the morning um, the ordinance even sp specifically calls out the carts being put out like at 11 o'clock at night or something of that nature I do remember reading that I have one instance where I actually had to go on to H Street and um, physically pick up all the carts because I couldn't get the, the property owner's attention. Uh, they've since only come back for half of those carts. 
that's the only incident that I'm aware of where we've actually physically taken back our carts. Uh, one of the issues is that with that respect of taking back some of the carts, this town gave each residence or um, dwelling two carts. So yes, to the town property, I could take those back. But when it comes to a business that has bought 10 or 15, I'd have a hard time taking back which they physically have paid for. Well, why are the carts on the, um, why aren't they out of sight and in the back? The planning board called for them to be out of sight or stored mm -hmm. not on the sidewalk. And as I stated, you know, we've met with this particular property owner and agreed to, of another location uh, to, to help meet a concern that uh, the butter directly behind had. So we've, we've worked with the particular property. Yeah, because the previous owner of this property, this is where there was a problem when Lebec Rouge owned it. The, the same exact area on this lot has always been a problem. Mm -hmm. And when uh, properties get transferred and they become under a new owner, that problem shouldn't continue. Right. But this problem is worse. Mm -hmm. And so why aren't those barrels where they're supposed to be? I, I see it as a health issue at this point. And it's a, a terrible health issue. Right. And it's something as a citizen of Hampton, I don't want to live in a town that allows this. It's terrible. And um, I would also say that another uh, business that has 40 uh, barrels, uh, they wash the barrels. The barrels are completely clean. Mm -hmm. They're stored up there. They were stored this morning. After they were picked up, they're immediately put. They look like uh, uh, Christmas ornaments. They're stacked right the way they should be. Uh, the ones at Bernie's are stacked nicely right now, mm -hmm. but they're still sitting on town sidewalk, uh, probably about four inches. And um, and there's no way a wheelchair can go down because the wheelchair would be going, it would teetering off on the side. The, you know, I'd be afraid to do it. And uh, also the other uh, establishment that has those 40 barrels, their sidewalks and everything get washed down. And in my opinion, everyone that has a business down there should be washing their sidewalks, and maybe they wash theirs too. Mm -hmm. But. Anyone that goes out for a morning stroll and wants to walk through the vomit and the slime, it's just not acceptable to be a beach resort, and I just can't imagine. My heart goes out to that lady that has that motel. My only other suggestion would be that um, myself, the manager, maybe the code officer, please, we review the... Who is the code officer? Uh, Kevin? Kevin Schultz. Yeah. And you can't tell me that the health department, the health that checks the restaurant doesn't um, keep track of that the fact that you can't get to their back door because uh, so much trash is piled up there? I'd be guessing. I'd, I'd be presuming things outside of my jurisdiction. Well, I think we need to look at who we need to report this to because it's obviously something that the town is not able to cope with. And I think that uh, if we are going to be doing anything in the future, we need to make sure that we uh, have some um, invite other people in to talk about this because I want to point out that everybody else seems to be doing exactly what they have promised to do and what's expected of them. Understood. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> anything else? Chris? I'm all set. Thank you very much. Yep. Did you get a copy of these pictures, Chris? I did. I, I received the original email uh, today. Uh, last week. No, this is one that's one today. Um, Christine? With, with the issues that went on this afternoon, I have to admit I didn't yeah. get on to my computer. But uh, yes, I'm sure that they're or that the manager will make them ultimately available to me. Thank you. Thank you. Morning. All right, we're Thank going to you. skip over the town manager's report, and we're going to go to old business. And under old business, we're going to go to Bernie's Beach Bar Entertainment License. We've had a number of meetings on this. We've had a number of uh, people commenting and on the noise. We've had experts in on both sides discussing it with us. We've had reports from the police department on the issue so I think what we're going to have to do is go to the board now and the board's going to have to make a decision on this on what they're going to do so I'll be glad to make a motion but Phil I want to down? I want to uh, recuse myself from the board mr. chairman okay thank, thank you, you.
Well, first of all, I want to say that it looks like there's still issues primarily after 11 o'clock at night. Um, but I also want to say that to single out one establishment is wrong and can't be done. Because I don't see any direct proof in front of me that shows violations per where the ordinance says the violations have to occur. We may have them, I haven't seen them yet. So I think the board needs to consider something that this whole ordinance needs to be reviewed completely. For either the time, and the time needs to be applicable for all. So cutting, up, cutting off Al Flurry at one specific time and not doing it to all other businesses is not gonna work in my book. So I would um, like to hear maybe, I have a motion in mind, but I would like to maybe hear from board members first before I state it, if that's okay. Can yeah, I we'll just ask Fred one question? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Sure. Uh, Fred, uh, like in the um, DPW director's uh, uh, letter that he wrote, he's uh, asking that this be tied to the entertainment license. Now, is uh, these health issues, are they, can they be tied to the entertainment license or to the opinion, license? They, in my opinion, they could not be. They're separate issues dealing with different codes. So let, let's continue. Rusty? Well, you, you know, people think that, you know, we just sit up here and I've spent at least five nights down the beach specifically on this, this issue. Um, Saturday night I was at at, I went down to Bernie's 10.30 at night. Um, I went down, listened. They had a very large crowd there. I hadn't seen that many people there in a long time. Um, listened, had a conversation while I was standing at the rail. Um, could hear that person talking back and forth, normal conversation. I then got in my car and uh, walked across the street to my car and listened for a while. I went down to Haverhill Ave, Bradford Ave, and the noise was not obtrusive. They had a big band playing there, I guess. I assume it, it was with the crowd that was there. I didn't, it's not my style music, so I didn't, uh, I didn't say, but the, the noise wasn't loud. Uh, I did this back in early June. I went in July too, but in early June, uh, I went and listened. And uh, it, it was funny because I was sitting on Haverhill Street and the music coming out of one of the houses on Haverhill Street was louder than the music being played at, at Bernie's. Now, that doesn't create to uh, an entertainment license, but the fact is you have ambient noise all around the place. Uh, you have motorcycles going by. You have people yelling and hollering. Um, so... I agree with the, the the police chief that he he's addressed that yes maybe something is there but he can't necessarily tell if you put up meters to, to watch it you can't tell where that sound is actually coming from you can't um, you can't set the ordinance is not clear enough to say as some people say it's at the property owners at the business owner's property line. And other people say it's at the property line of the offensive, of the person that feels offended. We definitely have to work on this, uh, this noise ordinance. Uh, I would like to see us form a committee to address this ordinance and, and have some business people, have some uh, residents look at the ordinance and see if, in fact, for next year, if it's something that we need to address. I think it is. I think 50, when, when I watch this, one of these decibel meters and, and watch it and people talking, conversation is almost at 50. I know down the beach, and I've lived on that beach for quite a long time, um, worked on that beach for a long time, just the ambient noise around there most of the time is over 50 unless you're there in January or February, but then I think the wind would be uh, that noisy too. So I think it is something that needs to be looked at, and uh, I'm waiting to see what what happens with a motion here. I'll let everybody else have their talk before we decide to come up with a motion. And so. 
in my opinion, it should be 11 o'clock for everybody. And if people are, there's people, when it was 11 o'clock, there were people then that played after 11 o'clock. No one complained. There was no problem. And it could still be the same way. People should be able to complain to 11 o'clock if there's any problem. I think 10 o'clock is unreasonable and because this is a beach resort. Uh, but by 11 o'clock, there shouldn't be any noise that's totally uh, annoying other uh, neighbors and neighbors that are far away, neighbors that are close, wherever. Uh, if they can um, play after 11 and no one's going to be concerned, it w I wouldn't have a problem with that. That's the way we did it for years. This went to uh, 11.31. The one year that I was not here in the last 15 years, this law got changed. But before that, it was always 11. And we, ne we didn't really have any problems. I can think of one place we had a problem with in all those years. And, uh, and it was actually two. Uh, and one of them, th there were so many complaints with the liquor commissioner that no one ever questioned. It was just a problem. Um, so I think that we should make it 11 o'clock. And if people can play louder and there's no complaints, so be it. It's, you know, there's a lot of things. Uh, the police do what they can. As long as no one's complaining, I don't, you know, I don't have a problem with it. I definitely feel that we need to redo this, uh, um, ordinance and the last time it was done it was done exactly like what you're suggesting rusty the uh the public was involved al was very much involved in it um everybody was excited everybody thought they were doing the right thing the police chief thought he was doing the right thing and i guess it couldn't have turned out worse didn't solve one thing and has done nothing but waste this board's time ever since and actually, the first time before we got to that, there was a lot that went in, and there were a lot of public hearings. Uh, so this is obviously a hard problem. Um, but we have a responsibility to the people, and we have a responsibility. I still want to know what's going to be done with these trash cans. They don't belong there. There's no one's given them permission. Why are they there? This is not right. Um, I know... I know Rick's concerned about the trash, and I believe that Mr. Flurry is well aware of the trash condition. Now I am, and I would love to talk to you and tell you how. Okay, well, but that, that's a separate issue, right? Actually, but, and I Fred mean, said it's a separate issue. Let's deal with the right. With the, so, this. as far as the interest, I agree with Rick. Okay. I think the ordinance is, you know, the more the more you get involved in something, sometimes the more problems it creates. So, you know, we had it at 11, and it was fine. Now we have it at 11:59. We got 50 decibels after 11. Sorry, but 50 decibels is ridiculous. It's unenforceable. Now, yes, the police can go down and say, oh, yes, it's 55. Yes, technically that's, you know, over the limit. But by the time, which residents have pointed out to me that live on Havel Ave, they call the police. By the time the police get down there, because you know they're doing something else when you call them, plus if there's traffic, whatever the case is, it's 15, 20, 25 minutes have gone by. So they take the reading. It's not going to be the same reading that you took from your phone or whatever you used. It's, it's <coughs> we're running around in circles. And now Al, Bernie's is new, so there is new music coming that people aren't used to. But I'm down that beach. I work down there two nights a week. I am down there at least three or four nights a week. And every other time I'm down there, I either actually physically go into Bernie's. I was there one night this weekend when Rusty was there. We were up on the deck. We had a conversation. I walked over to Havel Ave. I used my phone. I know that's not the most accurate thing, but the highest reading I got, I think it was about 1030. I was on the Havel side of the bathrooms, and it was maybe like 62, 63. And then I went over later in the night, and I think it was lower than that. I didn't, I didn't keep as good track of it as I should, and I apologize for that. But I've gone to every bar in that beach, and Bernie's is no louder, if not less loud, than the other bars down there. So Could you I just wait, 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 let me, wait, just wait, point of clarification. You work at the beach, but you do not work I for do not Al. work okay, at Bernie's. Okay, I want to make sure that there's no Leone's. conflict of interest here. I bought Nobody thinks that. twice a week. And I'm going right, to say something, so hang on. <laughs> All right, All right. So, <laughs> so I'm going to speak too, so hang on. 
Number one, on the, on the vulgar language, the fellow that was speaking about the vulgar language, I agree with you 100% on that, but I also know that it's a free speech issue and it's terrible. I worked at a school where they made kids take off their t-shirts that were vulgar. The parents sued the, school, sued the town and they won that they could wear, and they were vulgar t-shirts. They were terrible. The, the way language is today, it's, it's horrendous what people do and say, but it's protected speech. And that's terrible. I, I agree 100% with that. The other thing is, all I can speak for is myself. I went down to Bernie's Friday night. My wife and I stood at the railing and had a conversation, an easy conversation. And my wife said, we've been at weddings when you couldn't talk like this. We were right in front of where the band was playing. We left. We went over to Haverhill Street, or Haverhill Road. We sat there on the bench right by there and could not distinguished noise that was uh, excessive. I drove up to Boar's Head. I stopped my car. I got out of the car. We sat there for a while listening. And I mean, I can only speak for myself. I mean, that's exactly what I what I experienced. And it was, I've been in a lot of music venues, and they've been a lot louder than that. Drive you crazy. You couldn't have a conversation. I mean, we could have a normal conversation without yelling at each other. I agree with the other issue, the whole uh, trash issue, I agree 100%. That's got to be cleaned up, absolutely, and we've got to deal with that if it doesn't. But on the noise issue, I, I just all I can speak for is myself. I mean, I hear, I listen to experts, but then all I can speak for is myself and what I heard with my own ears. And, you know, I had my, my wife was with me and what she heard. That's all I can speak to. So, Rick, go ahead. Okay, I'll make the motion that um, the... Uh, the nor the nor the uh, noise ordinance go to eleven o'clock like it always was when we didn't really have any problems. Let the police take care of it. If there's a problem, let the police take care of it. But that's what they should they that's what they should be doing. Let them get out and deal with the people. So that but the or, the motion we need has to deal with allowing granting Bernie's Bernie's license. Bernie's license. So what you're saying, Rick, is to grant Bernie's till 11 o'clock? If everybody's at 11, uh, let them yeah. all be that way. But, Why should they all be different? But we're dealing with Bernie's license right now. So we have okay, well, it change. should be 11 o'clock then. Can we change the ordinance to 11 o'clock, just us? No. no. Tell, tell me you vote to do that. So, right. so what? That's true. I still say that it should stay you, at 11 o'clock, and we should work to that goal. We what, can't change the ordinance. What the board can do. Under the section 149-9, uh, subsection A, outside entertainment, activity shall only be allowed between the hours of 12 noon and 11.59 p.m. or earlier if specified by the Board of Selectmen. And that's Those are what the we're trying to do. So that's the motion that I want to make, 11 o'clock. And I think that that's reasonable. There's some people here that want 10. He wants 12. That's somewhere in the middle, 11. I think we've compromised. And I think that we should work to make sure it's that way everywhere. Uh, we should sponsor uh, an article uh, to be put forth that it's 11 o'clock for all entertainment license. And then if they can play later and not have a problem, who cares? That's the way it is everywhere. We're not looking to have a bigger government. But We're just looking to make sure the government takes care of what's happening. And that's not what's happening here. Right, but if you if you say that he can play till eleven, he can play then. later, but it just can't be making noise. After he can't be playing a full band until twelve o'clock at night. Yeah, that's a problem. If you I, haven't heard I, that, I, it's, you, I agree. You're deaf. I'm not deaf, Greg. Well, and I agree with you. No, no, let's keep. We're going to keep it I, and civil I'm, amongst the board. I'm trying to. Yes, do I that. know that. That if you say it's eleven, then that's what it is. It's eleven. I don't think we can. No, say, if you well, say it's 11, you can't go... The, right. The, yeah. You can't say, well, they can do it afterwards as long as it doesn't bother anybody. That, you can't say that. That's not part of the, what this motion has to be. Am I correct? Well, it could correct. be 11 you, as long as, you know, you don't have to continue I, the loud noise. I have a problem having one rule for okay. Bernie's. Hang on one, hang on one second. We have a motion. Do we have a second? We don't have a second. Motion do, does, doesn't pass. Do we have anybody else making another motion? Yeah, I'd like to make a motion that we give Al his license and we see him again in April. Do we have a second? I think this is terrible. You're not listening wait, to Wait, 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 wait. 
Do we, we have well, a second? We're going to discuss this. We're going to fix gonna the ordinance. It. We're going to discuss it, but I'm waiting to see if we have a second. So it applies for everyone. Remember. Do we have a second on Regina? We, we're going to have to make some kind of decision here, guys. The voters are ultimately going to make yes, a decision. Yes, that's fine. That's right. Well, okay, would war. you hold on, Rick? I know you're getting angry, but hold on because we're going to have some decorum here, all right? Do we have a second from Regina's motion? I'll second it for discussion. Okay, now we're open to discussion. I'm going to start over here, Regina. Okay. The problem, which I have talked to every single person, except for John that lives behind Patricia. I have not talked to him personally. But, you know, everyone's told me that it's better. Now, they have problems. The problems that appears to me are happening mostly after 11 o'clock. Okay? So, after 11 o'clock, if you're down on the beach after 11 o'clock, you walk on the boulevard at 1030, you got traffic going by, you get all this stuff that is muffling the noise coming from Bernie's. Now, I'm down there. I notice it. I walk around. I ride my bike down there at 9.30 in the morning, 10 in the morning, 11.30 sometimes, 2 o'clock, 9 o'clock at night, 10 o'clock at night. Bernie's, you can't hear. You drive by it in a car. You drive by it on a bicycle. Something is happening after 11 o'clock, whether it's people being in the bars, back at their cottages, having less noise outside. Whatever it is, it's making the noise coming from Bernie's the only thing that the people on Havel Ave can hear and concentrate on because it's 11 o'clock at night and they're trying to go to bed or do whatever they're trying to do. We know that there is a concern. Al, after 11 o'clock, something's got to happen, whether it's the profanity. I know there's only so much you can do because once someone has a microphone in their hand, they can say whatever they want. I mean, it's just, it's the way it is. It's unfortunate you don't want children hearing that type of music. But there has got to be a way that we're what? We're almost in August. When, I mean, how long is Bernie's open for? Because like, we so actually... Whoa, 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 well, well, excuse me, Regina here. has the floor. Okay, but Excuse me, Regina has I'm the floor. I want to know how, what time Wait, frame we have left. Hold on a minute. Regina has the floor, we'll let her speak. She, we'll let her people. speak. From Go the ahead. audience. Go ahead. I would like to know what time, how much of a time frame Bernie's has left for this Well, wait, season. Regina, we're, Is that, we're yeah, not having a back and forth. All right, here. so, fine, we won't have a back and forth. Not say right. we have okay. three months left. Say he goes through the end of October. All right, so we have three months left. So why can't we just make it that after 11 o'clock, we schedule some type of a monitoring to go down there? And if he's out of whack, we let him know right away. Do you want to? Do you want to? I would. But like the only to. trouble is, I'm, I'm, and we're not going back and forth with any more witnesses or anything. But I'm right. sure that Chief Sawyer might say he doesn't have the the manpower to provide but, monitoring after eleven o'clock. Can I o'clock. ask the chief a question? No. Why don't you ask the town manager? All right, town manager. Can I ask you something? Is it true that sometimes the, there's a detail of Bernie's on Fridays and Saturday nights for? Police? When the chief considers it to be an essential function, yes. Okay, so if he could consider, if he considered it to be an essential function, could he perhaps have that officer do a random testing? If he gives that order, the officer would do it. Okay. Would you like me to come up? Yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> To answer Regina's question, uh, we have been having police details at Bernie's at the request of the ownership. Unfortunately, with the depleted ranks we have, we are not always able to fill that. Um, Friday night, I believe, Saturday night we had two officers there, but Friday night we didn't. Okay, we have a lot going on uh, down there at the beach with different assignments to the point we're actually bringing in officers from other towns to try to help accomplish the mission. State police isn't able to provide us with with the resources they used to. I used to get eight to ten troopers uh, out there, and on Saturday night I had one. Okay, it's just not it's not an essential function. You know, you know, when when we use the word essential, we're talking about life safety. This is a nuisance, and I, I understand it's a real one. But to say that I can dedicate an officer and it's going to happen, I can't commit to that. I just don't have the personnel to do that. Um, I do have uh, on 
believe it was Friday night, where I knew there wasn't going to be detail, detail officer down there, I did send one of the corporals down with the sound meter to make some measurements. And I just want to clarify on the, on the profanity issue, if I could, real quick. There is a freedom of speech element to it, but there is also a disorderly conduct element to that. The problem with it is people have to understand, if somebody is using profanity, I, I experienced that a little bit myself over the weekend, some people that were dissatisfied with some of the enforcement actions I took uh, during motor vehicle enforcement, highway safety grants, and I had some of that directed to me as chief of police in front of people. The police cannot be the offended party. Okay, that's case law in New Hampshire. We can't, if somebody drops an F-bomb, I can't arrest them for it. If there's somebody that's offense, offended by it, and it's reasonable that they would be offended by that, like an amplified situation like that, and they're willing to testify and give me a statement, that's something I may be able to try to curb that type of activity, and I think Mr. Fleury doesn't want to be known for that anyhow. I think that message has been made clear tonight. In the future, if there are things like that, we can take a report, but the person who is offended would have to be coming to court as a witness because the police cannot be the offended party. So if that clarifies any of that. Thank you. Rusty? I got a question for the town manager. Uh, um, on a usual entertainment license that's indoors, what does the time go to on that? I believe there, let me read the licensing procedures. Hours of operation. The Board of Selectmen may vary the hours of entertainment activity based upon the circumstances of the application, i.e. more restrictive hours or additional hours. The using, operating, or permitting of an entertainment activity shall not be allowed between the hours of 1 a.m. and 12 noon on any day of the week. Outside entertainment activity shall only be allowed between the hours of 12 noon and 11.59 p.m. or earlier as specified by the Board of Selectmen. Those are your powers. So look, we have, we are, <coughs> and so by granting it as... Uh, with unrestricted, he's he's good till eleven fifty nine. That is correct. You have other you have at least one restricted license I know of in town. And what's that? Uh, that one, you know, the chief will have to refresh my memory. But Stacy James. Stacy James. Yeah. Ten o'clock. Yeah. So we 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 have history of restricting some. Um, And you have denied some licenses. And we have denied some. Yes. You know, I, uh, like I said, I, I've been down there specifically for this one specific case at least five times that I can remember in the past month or so. Um, and I went down on different nights, different times. Um, you're going to hear different noise on if the atmosphere is different. Um, I, I think... Al has done a much better job this year over last year. I think uh, uh, he did try to work with the people, uh, or, or is trying to work with the people in the neighborhoods down there. He, um, when they brought it to his attention, I mean, he has gone and met with those people. He has done that, and I, I take Al at his word that he's going to continue to try to do that. Um, so, and that's why I, I second Regina's motion to um, to allow it. Now, I would I wouldn't even mind if if they did. I can understand the people's Monday, uh, Sunday through Thursday, wanting it earlier so they could have that. I could see doing eleven o'clock on that those nights and go to the eleven fifty nine on Saturdays and Sundays. I mean Fridays and Saturdays. I think that might help out the people in the neighborhood. It'll give them a little bit of relief until we. But we need to work on this ordinance. We need to find out. I, I know what it what used to be, Rick. I know how it used to be. Um, but I think 50 decibels is way too too low to expect uh, in the beach type district. Um, and I know residential A butts up to the beach district, and you're always going to have that problem when when two different. Uh, zones meet up with each other so um, I would rather see like I said I'd rather see 11 o'clock 
Sunday through Thursday, and then the 1159. And we revisit the ordinance? And we revisit the ordinance uh, in the fall and because work on we, it. we make it 11, then we don't even have to worry about this 50 anymore. 75 to 11, that's it. Yeah, I don't that's have a the problem end of with it. I never had a problem with no? 11. All right, if I will reframe my motion, if you will second that motion. To 11, 11 o'clock on Sunday through Thursday. Sunday through Thursday, and 11. And 11.59 on Friday, Friday Saturday. Saturday. I'll second that. Well, what is about Sunday? Is Sunday Sunday through 11? Thursday. <coughs> Sunday will be 11. Okay, okay. I, uh, I feel better about that. Um, so is it my time to talk? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> uh, You're a good man. So uh, I intend, after we're finished here, to talk about the other issues that I mentioned earlier, and not just for here, but for, for all of the places. Um, so, yeah, you know, I agree with Regina. I was glad to hear you say, yeah, something after 11 o'clock, something's going on, you don't, it's, everyone's going to bed. There's not a problem. You know, people are watching the news, and, you know, there are people that live in this area. Uh, I do feel better about this. I think it's better. We've already heard from the chief that um, he there'll be no more of uh, being people told when they call to complain that um, well the Board of Selectmen agreed to that and that's just the way it is and we can't um, investigate because that's what many people were told that's what many people came at the beginning of this conversation that that, that was a big problem for a lot of people and it didn't even sound right so it's good that we know that that's not going to happen. If people still have an issue, they can call up and complain. Um, uh, and the season is, we're, you know, it's getting on. There's not that much more time um, left. So we, have, we can see how this works, and we can work to make something better. Uh, I think in the end, the voters are going to decide in many ways uh, if they're being listened to. Okay, um, I just want to say that when we're talking about this, when I, when I look at the, the report from the police on different days, and it says complaint received, level not in violation, complaint received, level not in violation, they didn't, it doesn't say told, said the selectman we could do this, but it says no violation of ordinance were identified, and that's on one, two, three, four, five different instances. That's from last year? Uh, 2017. Well, That's last this year. year was 16, and people, this people have been 2017. Saying, 2017 started in, in January? Yes, that's the okay. May, June, July, that's now. Okay, well, it does, last year they did, they did, right. well, this, right now he doesn't have the uh, uh, license. That's why they didn't have to say it. Last year he did have the license, and people were told when no, they no, called. No, no, no. He's, he's a, a complaint. He has a he has a temporary license. He's had people, complaints Last now. year he didn't have an unrestricted license. No, I'm in talking about right now complaints that are filed right now. I'm talking about the complaints from last year. But right. Well, I'm talking about right now because there's been changes to the made to the to the uh, the venue. There's been changes made to the speakers. There's been changes made to a lot of stuff. So I'm talking about complaints right now. And I think that's what them. we have to work with right now. I know. And he didn't have a license, so people called up, and they were able to be dealt with by the police. Last year, people didn't came here. I didn't dream this. That people came and said they called the police department, and they were told. Right, but I'm talking. We, we okay, have to talk okay, about current. I don't care. Uh, I, I, well, that's logic. Well, I don't want it to go like it was last year. That's what I'm well, saying. I agree 100%. That is logical, too. I agree 100%. So my logic works just as well as yours. Just because you went down there when it wasn't noisy, that's your deal, not mine, okay. and not these people. Have you gone down? Yes, I have. Okay. And you know what I found when I went down the other day? I didn't hear the band either, but I could hear the people talking, and you should have heard what they were. It was, I found it kind of offensive. It was very, very noisy. It's but that's beside the point. Okay. I'm willing to do what we're saying to do here. Okay. But just what you're happy with doesn't mean that's what these people are happy I don't say with. that. I'm not saying okay. that what I'm happy well, with is what they're happy with. Well, you're not That's the only point I want to make. That's Thanks. good. Thank you. I would rather see the, the, it, it say Friday and Saturday and Sunday, he, the weekend he can have till 12 o'clock. Right. Just because you've got you've got 11:59. Just because the weekend is you know so you're taking one day and I. All right. So what's the motion? 
so that we give out your motion. his license. The only restriction will be Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, 11 o'clock for this season only. And the whole ordinance is getting revisited on the town warrant for the March 2018. And if there are excessive complaints that are backed up, Mr. Town Manager, sir, we can always revoke the license, right? You can. At any time. That's correct. At any time. Yeah. All right. As long as you go through the procedures and the license, yes, you can revoke it. But was it that way last year? That you could revoke? Why were, why were people told that they couldn't complain? I have no idea. I didn't tell them. We didn't even find out about the, I didn't find out about the complaints at the end of the season, and That's I'm pretty right. sure the owner didn't either, so. All right, so we, we have, have a motion. motion. We have a second. We have any more discussion? I don't want to close it off. Was that? Take a take a vote. All in favor? Opposed? I will go with the uh, in the with the idea that this is going to somewhat be better. It's just the beginning. Now I want to make another motion. Well, wait, wait, wait. Yeah. Did you vote yes. against or yes? Yes, I voted yes. You voted yes, so it was Because it's somewhat of an improvement. I okay. don't think it's the okay. perfect answer. Okay. We all don't think it's the perfect answer, right? Right. I mean, that's, none of us think it's, none the, perfect of think it's the perfect answer. But this stuff has but to be addressed. I would also like to make a motion you may. that the we've got a letter from the DPW director that and he said it right here tonight that this is a health issue I want this investigated and I want to find out why the carts are not put behind the building I mean maybe it was hard before but now they bought the other property behind there there's got to be other places to put these barrels that aren't on the town right away and doesn't stop, doesn't affect people that are in wheelchairs that might want to go up and down those uh, uh, sidewalks that we invested and the taxpayers paid for you so did. that they would be handicapped accessible. That's correct. That's the reason. So, you built them. so when we'll, so, we'll, by the time we come back here the next time, Fred, are these answers? Are these things going to be addressed? I've already uh, addressed those issues to the health officer. And he's going to have to inspect the property. If there's a health violation, there will be a summons issued. Mm -hmm. And these barrels are going to be removed from this sidewalk. The ordinance requires the barrels to be removed from public property as soon as uh, they are picked up and the material taken out of them on the regular collection date, whatever, whatever that date is. Okay, so tomorrow when I go down there, they're not going to be there at well, this time. Uh, what? Good luck. Okay. Have it done in that amount of time. Rick, I, I think we hear what you're saying, or I hear what you're saying. I think uh, the town manager has already spoke to the uh, public works director. He's already spoke to the left message for the health officer to get on look. I would think that, uh, I would hope that within a week we can have a report back from them of some resolution. I'm sure the uh, property owner would like to... Uh, talk with both of them and I'm sure with all three of them they can come up with a viable solution to the problem and we have a, a, a note back by next week so that we can bring it up again yeah. and I will tell you I want to say that when you go down there and take a look the uh, it's amazing how many people how people everyone tries to do the right thing and um, when people are allowed not to do the right thing, I think some of the problems, and I could mention a two or three places, it was more of a problem today when people put their trash out because it's Monday morning and it's that once a week uh, oh, yeah. pickup. Those are the people that are kind of abusing it. Uh, but as far as the other commercial places, I didn't see any problems. Well, I, I, I like I've been the down, way they wash their barrels. Well, and I like the way that some of the businesses down there wash their sidewalks down. They they power wash their sidewalks. They, yeah, they do if everything, someone but, throws up, you need to do I, it because that is a health issue. I don't disagree with you, but I think we have there's more That's than this just place. this one issue down the beach, and um, I, I would like Public Works to take a look at all of it. Okay. And now's the time to do it while the businesses are in session. And Attorney Ells is standing up. Do you have a and point get of in order? Touch or with the other businesses, well, it's they're still I available. Just have a question. If 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 the board's done, Mr. Flurry would, uh, on behalf of Al, we'd like to have a copy of these letters. Apparently, everybody else has been advised of these problems, except him. This is more appropriately handled between the owner his manager and Kevin Schultz, the health officer, 
You I just see. need to bring it to his attention uh, rather than, believe it or not, you guys have more important things to do than the planning board uh, approved this with conditions of approval. If he's violating those, there's a remedy there. The health officer certainly has all the authority in the world, and Al isn't interested in any more violations. You take these pictures for the last three days. Well, You'll see them I, all right there. I'd, I'd really no like to complaint. receive. You see it for yourself. There I'd, re I'd really like to receive ahead. copies of all of these letters, and uh, I appreciate the photos. Yeah. But hang on one second. I, 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 if I can, if I may, just I'm sure the town manager tomorrow will will inform Kevin Schultz. To, and I will have a chat tomorrow morning. And any, any complaints that he has to relay the complaints and relay the violations to Mr. Flory and to be taken care of. That would be all we all would ask for, yes. and he'll fix it. Yes. Thank and, you. And as I just said, if he can do that, but also work with the, the property owner, right? Because I'm sure the property owner is more than happy to, to work at correcting the situation. Okay. Again, he should have been notified. Yep. Well, go down right now, just right by, and look, you'll see it. It's still there. It was there at five right. minutes to six. Why, why? Okay, okay, hang well, on. Al. That's what it is. Al, hang on. Rick, it's hard to on. take when it's true. Uh, can we move on to, what we're going to do is, is we're moving on from this now. We're going to new business, and we're going to ask the state reps that are here to talk about the Coakley landfill. Would you please do that? Thank you. Mr. Town Man, uh, would you like to just, or oh, Virginia, you could kind of taken the lead on this, right, on the water yes, thing? Yes. Would you like to introduce what's going on here? And yes, actually, I helped with the, well, Fred did it, but we worked together on sending a letter out to the uh, EPA because we're concerned with the trace amounts of uh, PFCs that have been found in some of the Aquarian wells. And uh, Representative Mesmer has been working closely on this issue, and I would like to invite her to uh, speak on it and fill everyone in on what's going on with the uh, levels that have been found. Thank you. Um, Representative Mem Mindy Mesmer from Ryan, Newcastle. Um, my background is I have about 28 years experience in environmental consulting before I was elected. Um, and I'm also a, uh, I have had my own environmental consulting business. <clears throat> And I'm also a student in a public health related field right now. So I have a bit of background in this sort of field. Um, I started working on uh, this issue before I was elected, actually, when uh, we uh, identified a cancer cluster in the Rye, Newcastle, the five town area. And the task force was formed by Governor Hassan at the time. And we started to look at some of the environmental issues in the seacoast. And the Coakley landfill came up as one of the first issues. So I just want to provide a little background. I also bought, brought some really big scale maps, if somebody wants to look at them at the end, that have all the data on it that I can fit with um, the southern area uh, uh, on one of the larger scale maps. So this is the Coakley Landfill. It's been there, uh, started in the late 1960s, where it was just a, uh, a gravel pit operation, and they took ledge out also. And in the process, when they had this hole, they started to fill it in with all sorts of stuff. Uh, in the in early 1970s, they started. Uh, get, they had a license approved to do municipal waste. In 1972, they realized there was more than just municipal waste coming in, so they made it a hazardous waste landfill. Um, and the waste that came in was from all sorts of different areas. This shows you uh, where the landfill is. It's up on the corner of Breakfast Hill Road and Route One. Uh, is the Rye landfill, and then to the east of that is the Coakley landfill. So it's up in the, it's, it's actually bordering on several towns on Greenland, Northampton, and Rye. Um, so it's one of 150 unlined landfills. I mean, it has nothing underneath the landfill. Uh, it just was filled in with waste and then capped on the top in the late 1990s, I think. Uh, several towns used it to put all sorts of waste in there, and uh, also the Air Force, the Navy, and uh, lots of different uh, chemical companies and other hazardous waste generators and haulers. 
So that uh, back in 1990, it was um, it was capped on the top um, and left. Uh, this is an aerial photo of around 1984 of the area along Breakfast Hill Road where the entrance of the landfill was. You can see all sorts of junk around on the ground. This is the southern most, most portion of the landfill. There was a bunch, it was a, it was a very large area. I think it was about, I can't remember how many acres, but 90, something like 27 acres are capped right now, but I think it was 90 acres total um, that was used as the landfill. And you can see there's water, there's some uh, drum-like material up on the right-hand side. Um, so it was put in there as liquid waste, it was put in there as um, trash, and also drums and things like that were put in there. Um, to the west of the landfill, you can see there's a rail bed, which exists to this day. Um, it's used for recreational purposes right now. To the west of that, um, there are several surface water bodies that originate. One is Berry's Brook that flows to the north. One is Norton's Brook that flows to the west. And Little River flows down through, through Hampton. Um, and this has been a really important focus of a lot of work I've done because those surface water bodies are receiving some flow um, and contamination, especially Berry's Brook to the north. This map shows you there's a red dot sort of in the middle where Copley landfill is, and it basically just shows that the landfill's on a hill and groundwater flows in all directions away from the landfill into all the towns, including Greenland, Rye, Hampton, and Northampton. <clears throat> this is a cross section, so if you cut uh, the Copley landfill in half from the ocean to the east to uh, the west, this would be the cutaway version of it. And you can see that it sits up on a hill and groundwater flows on the top. The brown portion is the sand and, and uh, unconsolidated deposits, and below that is bedrock. And you have a, a variety of different flow regimes that'll flow straight down, get into fractures, and flow in various directions. Uh, so the cap, the cap was placed in 1993 or so, and that was left basically uh, with nothing underneath, like I said. But over time, people <coughs> put in housing developments with private wells, and then there were golf courses and things put in around. And uh, the contamination that we knew about at the time was just things that would degrade over time naturally, like hydrocarbons and things. Um, so for a while, it seemed like it was OK. And most of the neighborhood around, the neighbors around uh, um, in Rye and Northampton had municipal water brought in. But over time, uh, developments were put in in Greenland and golf courses, and that started to drag contamination out from under the cap. And in 2009, um, <clears throat> we have these things called emerging contaminants, which are contaminants that we find out about along the way. We didn't know about them at the time when the landfill was capped. But now we know that there are these things called emerging contaminants that they've uh, detected that don't really degrade. They're not amenable to degrade, uh, degrading naturally like some of the hydrocarbons are. So. As a, as a result of the work that we did the task force, we identified some significant um, emerging contaminants in 2016 at the landfill. And most of them are PFCs, they're called PFCs, um, which are made by DuPont or 3M, and they are basically what they used to make Teflon pans out of or um, stain coating, uh, I mean, um, stuff to keep stain off of carpets or uh, to make Gore-Tex material. Um, and those, Teflon, you know, the thing about Teflon is it's, it does really well in high heat. And it's really no, it doesn't degrade at all in the environment. So it sticks around for a long time. And it also, if it gets in your body, it tends to accumulate in your body. So that's where the problem has come. These contaminants are not amenable to natural degradation. It's, and they're in a variety of different products. You'll hear people say that. It's not really a big deal because it's a lot of stuff. But these levels that you get from normal day-to-day -day exposures are very low. So everything below that red line is what everybody normally would have in, in their body based on just normal day-to-day -day exposures. Everything above that line is what happens if you drink a certain amount of that uh, PFC contaminated water. And you can see various concentration levels will give you a certain amount of accumulation in your body. And now to the point where many children um, have PFOA in their body. Um, about 19 out of every 20 children have, have these chemicals in their body now. Um, and because of the things that we've identified along the way in terms of health effects associated with ingesting these um, chemicals, there have been several high-profile lawsuits um, against DuPont and 3M. They've discovered lots of um, kidney cancer and thyroid cancer and various kinds of cancers associated 
with ingesting these um, high concentrations of PFCs in the water. And as we learned over time, the concentrations that were allowable by EPA in various states have come down. So the concentration is on the left, and over time to the right, you, uh, to the current day on the lower right hand side, you can see how most states have come down a lot in what they consider to be acceptable, including the EPA, when they started at much higher levels. So that tells you that now, we, now that we know a lot more about health effects, the levels that are acceptable have come down. Up until about a year ago, the EPA said around 600 total um, of these two PFCs was okay to ingest, and now they say 70 parts per trillion. So that tells you about a year ago they thought it was okay to drink it at 600. Uh, now we think 70. So a lot of the work I've done actually at the state level has been to try and really look at, well, is 70 the right number? And I would contend that it's not. And other states like Vermont um, is down in the 20 region. New Jersey has a really... Um, a really uh, good scientific uh, group that works with them, and they proposed 14 is the right number. So um, some of the work that we've done at the state level has been to try to get down to a more acceptable level for health impacts. So uh, over the past year or so, the state has kind of come along, and a lot of the work I've done is try to push them into really evaluating what's going on around the Coco landfill. Um, it's been a long process. That pink area right there that you can see is the area that I convinced them to actually look and make sure there were no wells. Because uh, at first they said, well, there's nobody drinking the water in those towns anyway, so <laughs> there's no reason to worry about it. But actually there were quite a few people still drinking the water in that pink area that they located, um, and they sampled for PFCs. And the green dots are uh, no PFCs detected, um, and then the rest of the colors are varying uh, increasing concentrations. And you can see there's a bunch of red triangles around the Coakley Landfill. The red area is Coakley Landfill's uh, groundwater, groundwater monitoring zone. And within that red area, there are some pretty high levels of PFCs. And some of those PFCs at the very same levels are detected in Berry's Brook. So that tells you there's a direct communication between the landfill and the brook, which is very concerning because those PFCs, one of them in particular, that's not really regulated by the state is the third highest concentration in the world for that for that one PFC in our water in Berry's Brook and in the and Copley landfill. So those concentrations are likely to migrate away from the landfill in all directions. So um, with the golf course pumping a lot of water in in the upper left hand side, there's a lot of irrigation systems that people have um, installed in their in their residential areas, and those really draw a lot of water. So we're seeing some elevate, more elevated concentrations of yellow dots in those areas. You'll also note some yellow dots up to the northeast, some to the southwest, some out to the east where the Rye District water wells are. So um, it is really spreading away from the landfill, and that's a concern of ours. Southern <clears throat> part. Um, and so Here's a close-up of the Hampton area um, to the south, and the, I started talking uh, about Hampton's low levels. So the, the wells are actually North Hampton and Hampton, and there have been some now elevated, more elevated numbers coming, showing up in the, in the wells that serve Hampton. And this has been a concern of mine uh, that I've talked to Aquarian about over time. They, if you can see, there's about two years worth of data on there, and for two years, 2014 and 15, there were no PFCs detected, and in 2016, we started to see some in most of the wells. And they're in the, you know, 5 to 12 sort of range, but the problem is that they're increasing, so that's a concern of mine. It tells you that it's migrating to the south into that area. So, just to give you a little update, so three bills of mine have dealt with these issues. Um, 431 is a drinking water commission, which you may have already received a letter. Um, they're going to be looking for an appointment from Hampton to that Seacoast Drinking Water Commission and made sure there was a seat for Hampton on that board because it's important for all of us to work together in the Seacoast to make sure we protect our water um, resources. And then uh, a cancer cluster commission is going to be a more, uh, more formed from the task force. And then I have another bill that um, is going to look at ways to make the DHHS more closely monitor cancer clusters and environmental issues before they actually become big problems. 
So those are the three bills that I had um, go through this year. They're signed into law now. The governor signed them. Um, I think that's about it for this that I was going to talk about. Um, I've also submitted a letter on your behalf for um, the well MW22 issue with Aquarian. I had some current concerns about the work that they had planned, the way they planned to do it, and what they were planning to do. Um, I think where that well is located, there is um, a real danger of saltwater intrusion uh, if they pump that well for a long period of time. There's also some issues of overlap uh, on the well. It's uh, the um, capture zone itself that I have concerns about. So I don't know if I should. Any more questions or? Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you said you submitted your letter to NHDES, which I think she emailed all of us a copy to of whom? that. To the DES. Oh, the Department of Environmental Services. And also, Fred formulated a letter that I would like the board to sign today to go to U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, relating. But of course, oh, our town. Yeah. I should, I should have mentioned. I'm of sorry. course, our town manager said, well, if we just ask for them to trace PFCs, that's all they do. So he threw a couple other things in there, oh, too. I threw the whole ball of mix. Right. right. So <laughs> that's the letter that I would like to ask this right. board to sign tonight, and that right. could hopefully. Yeah. That could. So uh, I should have mentioned, too. So we, this has been a very long process, a very long, frustrating process for myself. But um, all of a sudden, last week, I think it was the DES, uh, in response to an 11 legislator letter, uh, that we signed, 11 of us Seacoast legislators signed, asking for action um, to do something about the surface water issues because it's migrating all, all these towns. Um, they did respond and say finally that they're going to put some signage up. Uh, they are going to look at potential issues with fish because Berry Brook and I believe some parts of um, some other surface water bodies that could be impacted by Coakley are, <coughs> are being fished out. Uh, they're being stalked and fished out and there's no warning at all for the people that access those fish or those waterways. So that's another issue they say they're going to address at some point. And then the bigger issue, they said, they finally said that they're going to address the remedial um, a solution to stop the flow into the berries, into the brooks. So that's a big uh, step. There's no schedule, however. So we have a meeting this week. Uh, I've asked um, Representative Bean to attend uh, at the state, and we're going to find out when they plan to actually do this stuff. So, But I'm happy that they've finally agreed to do that. So, Regina, we don't need a motion or anything. All we need to do is consent that we're going to sign that letter. Do we need to make a motion to sign that letter? It's in a pile somewhere. It's already over there? Yeah, I think so. Okay, cool. And I have a couple other requests from the board. I would like to, um, since Representative Mesmer is an expert in the environmental field, I would like to ask permission if we forward Tom Ballesteros' most recent comments, if we could give her a copy of that. Because I've read her comments and I've also read his, and uh, may I, Mr. Chairman, just yes. because you're into the situation awareness, could you explain who Mr. Bellastero is? For the oh, public? he yes. is. Oh, I'm Thank sorry. You. Thank you. <laughs> he is the little, expert that we've yeah. hired from UNH to look at the implementation of Well 22. So I would like to pull the expert's information in and combine that with our representative's information, and hopefully, if she looked at, it, I'm sure it would help her out and perhaps help him out, and they could maybe communicate in the future, if the board's okay with that. I'm, I, I think the board is fine with that. I think the board is, I would say, speaking yes. for the board, that the board's fine with anything we can do to help with this. I think what the state reps are doing and stuff is a great job and a great service to the community, and I think as much as we can, you know, keep on top of this water issue, right. because, I mean, this, this is an issue that's crucial to everybody's health. Right. And, and uh, we have to stay on and, top. And I think it would actually help our purpose and the larger goal of trying to have this addressed correctly. To uh, you know, if I could, if we could have that knowledge too, because part of the problem has been very segregated knowledge about certain <coughs> topics. And so I think not not anybody's fault, but the you know the DES has certain knowledge that we don't always have uh, access to. So I think if we can all work together. Um, if you have an expert and you wouldn't mind me, you know, no, and seeing also, this work would be very helpful. Um, our town manager had emailed Carl McMoran, our operations manager at Aquarian, okay. about this concern. And I have forwarded the response from Carl to Cindy, and she doesn't necessarily in 100% agreement with that. So I think that having her, you know, up to date on all our issues would definitely help us stay proactive <laughs> on this. And I would also want to ask the board to appoint me as the uh, 
Seacoast Drinking Water Commissioner appointee from the town of Hampton. So moved. Second. All in favor? Volunteers. Absolutely. <laughs> and Mike Edgar, I've talked to him today. Representative Pushing, you can't substitute. vote here. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're trying over there, but all right. I'm just, I just want to, I'm really glad that the board's doing this. And I have to say it's, it's really important to have somebody who understands the science and all this. And mm -hmm. I think yeah. it's having a hydrogeologist in the legislature is like hitting the lottery in some ways because when, I mean, the fact that the DES finally acknowledged that it's leaking and we mm -hmm. have to clean it up because we didn't do it right 20 years ago. Yeah. I mean, that's, a lot of people worked on it, but it really is Representative Messmer who forced the issue. All landfills leak. Yeah. Whether they have a liner underneath them right. or not, right. they leak. How many test wells are out in various areas surrounding the landfill and moving away? How many rows of test wells have they... In this area, in this particular area, or in no, general? No, for this, this well, how, what distance out, uh, you know, half a mile or test three wells, quarters, there whatever. There aren't too many, actually. Well, then they don't know what they're talking about. Exactly. And that's okay. been my point. Um, they yeah. have PFCs already in some of the aquarium wells, so yeah. that's migrating. Yeah. Okay, where's the plume? Where's the plume in? Where's it moving to? Exactly. That's a very critical. I closed yeah. one of these landfills in New Hampshire, mm -hmm. so I know what you're talking okay. about. It's very, very dangerous stuff. Yeah. Now, the only way to fix that, and there's only one way, is to dig the whole landfill up and move it and seal it. You could do some, you know, they're talking about a combination, or they had talked about in the past. So I'm not sure what they're planning right now, but in the past they talked about an interceptor trench with uh, wells that form a barrier of pumping. That's uh, fine as long as it doesn't get the bedrock. Exactly. Well, and then we have to be combined with bedrock wells. It has gotten in the bedrock for sure. Then, then it's yeah. too late. Yeah. The only way to stop is in the bedrock in additional the material from migrating in there is the same thing we did in New London. We had to dig up the yeah. entire landfill yeah. and move it into a sealed yeah. vessel. You're right. Yeah. There's just no other way to do that. Or otherwise, the entire landfill is going to leach into the right. groundwater. If you look, um, so the the red triangles extend to the very rightmost part of the landfill. Those are the highest concentrations. You can see the three yellow wells there on the right. Those are the rye water district wells. A year ago, I went and spoke to the DS and said, that's a problem. It's coming into rye. And they still haven't done anything. So your answer to your question is there's no wells to the right. 8,400 feet of the well now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So... You know, any time at all, and of course... If it gets in a fracture, it goes way faster. <clears throat> Where? Oh, yes. There's no question about getting into bedrock and into a fracture. There's no question about that. Where is planning on pumping at 1,350,000 gallons yep. out of the well 22 yep. for a week? Yeah. You know, I have no idea what the flow ratios are coming out of those 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 cracks in the, in the, in mm -hmm. the bedrock. Absolutely. But they could drag this whole landfill right into well 22 and contaminate every other well they in could, the region. Yeah, certainly in, is exacerbate the situation. Yeah. One of the comments they made in, their, in Carl's response was that, you know, it's everywhere. It's ubiquitous. And I made a point of saying this thing about um, it's in a lot of products. But if you look at this map, you can see all the green dots. It's not everywhere. Um, it, it's in... The particular areas where there are fractures that hit, those are those are mostly bedrock wells and circles, but it's not everywhere. So it's not um, yeah. it's you know, you have to follow the science and figure out where it's going, where it is. Okay. So is there is there anything else that we want any other action we want to take right now? I mean we've taken the action no. So the letter that Fred's put together that I wanted each member of the board yeah. to sign is, you know, sort of explain this yeah. whole situation to the Environmental Protection Agency. And I mean, at least aquarium should be testing this. Yep. I mean, what's I mean, what? How can it, if it's flowing, it's not going to get better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't care that it's only twelve right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the landfill's still leaking, mm -hmm. and we still got wells Absolutely. right there. Yeah. So. Okay. So we've done the letter. We've pointed yep. you to the commission. And. Thanks, Tom. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody else want to comment? Comments. Yes. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I want to say it's an honor to meet you. I've heard about you Thank from you. a lot of different people, including uh, people on both sides. Uh, Nancy Style oh, yeah. uh, had so many nice things to say oh, about nice. you. And Thank you. Tom Sherman and Carol Shea Porter. And it's refreshing to know that there's someone with your uh, ability up there to do this. And, you know, a lot of... I cannot think of another... <coughs> In Hampton, we have our own issues, as you just heard. But everybody's talking about this. All uh, everyone that has children 
old people, mm -hmm. and uh, everybody knows who you are. So yeah, it's amazing you. that you've been able to make so much uh, of an impression. And I'm very happy that you're there to do it. Um, I would, would like to ask, um, and maybe I missed it, what happens if you wash with the water? You know, your body or your clothes? We don't think that's an issue right now. Um, there's not any. There's no evidence to think that's an issue. And what about the people that are fishing in it? Do they eat the, the fishing? Fish? Yes, absolutely. And that is a huge um, issue of mine. I've been, I've been bringing that issue to their, to you know, for since January, since we knew. So uh, I had, I, I wasn't getting the, I wasn't getting the, the regulators to help with characterize what's going on, and they still haven't fully characterized what's going on in the surface water bodies. We, I went to Conservation Law Foundation. They sampled for us with private money that was donated by people. <clears throat> and then the state looked, and first they said it wasn't really true, and they went and resampled. Um, and so it's been a process. The reason I bring, give you the background on that, it's been a process for them to acknowledge it's a problem, for them to say they're going to do something about it. They finally have said they're going to do something about it. But in the meantime, my concern is there's children playing in these brooks. I saw children playing in the spring in the brook when I was there. Um, so that's a huge issue, um, and then and, and not even knowing that there's a risk. Um, and then the fish that have been stocked, there's 5,000 fish that are stocked in Berry's Brook alone, that there's no warning whatsoever to the people that are fishing those fish out, and I'm told they're, they fish out 5,000 a year. I'm not sure if they know that for sure, but, you know, um, this is a big issue. I mean, people are eating this fish. We don't think it's safe. I don't think it's safe with those numbers. There are other states like Michigan that if there was 12 parts per trillion of PFO, P, one of the PFCs, PFOS, in that water, they would tell you not to fish and not to eat the fish. We have about 100 times the concentration in Berry's Brook alone, and people are fishing. The same thing is happening at Pease. There's twice that, so there's 200 times what Michigan would say is not safe to fish. So this is a huge issue for me. The state um, stock it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And what about crops that might be grown? That we don't have a real good feel for yet. We do know that the root systems do take up PFCs, um, but I don't have enough information to know for sure what that level would do. I mean, it'd have to be in the soil and in the, in the water to get to the plants. But. Okay, well, thank you again. Thank, thank you. you. Mr. Bean. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm on the uh, New Hampshire Department of Environmental uh, website. Uh, they uh, do have an investigation uh, on that, so if folks want to go to that, uh, they, they do have that on the top of their website. Uh, uh, top of what? What is it? Uh, it's it's on their their uh, their homepage, and it's the investigation into uh, PFAs. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, in New Hampshire, uh, there's a number one eight hundred seven four two. 8498 and <clears throat> excuse me um, the most recent um, update to this website is January 10th of 2017 so it's it's seven months old I want to uh, um, thank you for your service and in the skill set that you bring to this issue uh, we are uh, the three of us serve up there and we wear dual hats in, in our personal lives and professional lives and sometimes in elected lives but you, you bring that scientific skill set that, that many of us don't have, and you're, you're leading with this, and, and Rainey and, and Mike Edgar uh, and, and many others, no matter which party they belong to, are, f are following your lead. Um, you, you're quoted here tonight, uh, Representative Messer is saying, from the, the Department of Environmental Services, on these very, very alarming uh, phenomena in terms of children uh, fishing uh, with these uh, carcinogenic uh, substances a threat. I've heard Mr. Welsh talk about a million dollar drawdown, uh, and you, you've said that you weren't getting any help from DES. I believe, as perhaps you do, and, and Mr. Cushing does, Representative Cushing, that your legislative success um, uh, stands on its own merit, but your responsibilities as a legislative transition and transcend into the operational responsibilities. And I'd like you to discuss how receptive or not receptive or responsive um, the state agency under the director of the uh, Department of Environmental Services has been to your efforts? Uh, that's, <laughs> uh, that's an interesting. Well, they have been difficult to bring along, um, to be honest. Um, it has been a frustrating process. Um, instead of 
you know, I look at things in terms of the science and what the data tells me, and, I, and as I answered your question about the plant, I don't have the information about the plant, so I wouldn't say that I know anything more than I know. But it, when things point to answers that I think need to be investigated or, you, you know, uh, that I have a good hunch on science, uh, I, I say it. And um, I was frustrated all the time about the fact that, you know, science could be pointing right at the answer and not the answer isn't, you know, followed by the state. So um, that's been a very frustrating process. When the brook samples were taken, they said there has to be a different source. Like, <laughs> what? There's no car wash there. There's no Teflon pans. We even had a joke. Somebody from Conservation Law Foundation said that. So <clears throat> I don't know why. I don't know what the resistance is. I don't understand it. I had, uh, I mentioned that I was looking at trying to lower the standards for PFCs for exposure in our state. Other states have done it. Um, it was a very frustrating process. Um, the DES just attacked my bills all the way um, uh, and, uh, and thwarted the efforts, basically. Um, so that, you know, when you see people um, acting against what you believe is to protect the public health and to, pr to protect our children when we know there's a cancer cluster in our area, that's very upsetting to see that your regulators are not really enforcing the same values in, in the work that they're doing. So I don't really understand a lot of what they did um, or what they're doing. Um, I sit there in some of the task force meetings, which maybe um, you'll be part of the commission, I hope, um, Representative Bean, but, um, and I see things said that are incorrect, and I counter every single one of them, and I shake my head now. Um, you know, I just, I don't understand it, so um, I'm, I'm frustrated by that. I'm happy that finally we have that letter that said that they're going to do these three things that I feel are really, really important, but um, it's been a frustrating process. <laughs> And I know Representative Cushing uh, has your back and is also an, on point up there and with his influence up there uh, and other legislators, it, it's got uh, wild support uh, for your, uh, your very, very important work. I wanted to speak back here at this level, Mr. Chairman, if I may, for a second. And we've talked about um, what we call our, our water person, if you will, but um, uh, Selectman Barnes being appointed to the committee, which are the uh, commission, which we, we just did tonight, and her interest uh, precedes this this coming up on the horizon here, and she does great work, uh, as does Mr. Welch. But I'm, I'm interested in in the town of Hampton because of our reliance on this very very near threat um, that uh, Representative Messner um, uh, provide information flow through her emails to DES, and we have a heightened sense of awareness um, of her communications with DES and those uh, to the uh, to the director and uh, to subordinates of the director, uh, including other legislators. Uh, I, I think that should extend to uh, you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and, and to the board, to the town website. I think that um, Mr. Welch and Attorney Gerald and the public works director, uh, along with Aquarian, should be uh, involved in a, a systemic um, uh, executive level uh, information base and that this be put up on the, uh, a higher burner, uh, if you will, uh, for the town. And uh, I think that there should be a concurrence amongst the board for that, that uh, we, we actually do that. Um, the uh, um, information request uh, for um, Aquarian and their response, and I've seen their response, and, and, and uh, I think that needs to be driven harder. Um, a more scientific approach when you talk about the million dollar drawdown in this. You take water out of the ground, there's a vacuum, and then these these flow. That's just the layman's term, but uh, I would I would suggest, Mr. Chairman, again, concurrence, and I think the board would, and, and uh, Representative Messler and Cushing would, that um, Aquarian be held to a higher standard of information and a more scientific uh, data uh, 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 flow to the town of Hampton. And I'm not satisfied with the response. I'm not satisfied with the state response. Representative Messner um, uh, has encountered some of the same difficulties we have on our relationship with the state. And we have seen this, Mr. Welch, with the Public Utilities Commission, where we weren't even allowed to speak in Concord. And uh, this does not speak to all of the, the good people that work for state government. But you will find that these are some of these um, people that are running these departments. Um, they're unanswerable. Uh, and they shut down communication, and you and I have experienced that. The public as a matter of fact, case. the gentleman that did it to us, the PUC, was just appointed as the head of the environmental right. department. Mm -hmm. So, where, where we went up to speak and take the time out of our busy days, and this was as a selectman, and we were prohibited from speaking. And the common courtesy would be, if you were a selectman or a representative, you were allowed to speak in a civil manner, and we were, we were denied that. 
And uh, this is a, a pandemic uh, phenomena up there, and it transcends uh, both some of these other agencies with uh, state agencies, yeah, a, a representative saying After that. After you, I want to talk. Yeah, um, and, and <laughs> nothing could be more alarming when we have this, this um, scientist talking about these threats where she is not getting the information. So we've talked about um, increasing the information flow, empowering the town attorney um, to make liaison with the query, integrating with Representative Messner. And um, um, I'm happy to uh, attend as, as you request me to on behalf of uh, the delegation. And uh, uh, just let me know. And uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative Messner. Thank you. Okay, hey, Regina, you got something? Yeah, just because of, I want to sort of say it right now, I was going to bring it up anyone to new business. Um, I formulated a letter late, late last week to all state elected officials. Now, there's a reason why I sent it only to elected officials, because we don't get responses from commissioners, directors, regulators, whoever the case may be. We don't get response. So, in my mind, the elected official is who was elected to represent the body of wherever the body is. Okay, so I, I addressed it to... Governor Sununu and to our state senator, and I cc'd a bunch of other people. All our local reps got a copy of it, our email, uh, to our U.S. representatives and our, and our U.S. senators. And I expect an answer. And if I don't get an answer, I've sent it to a couple other people that I know who hopefully will get me some additional places that I can get the letter to because, oh, and I also, of course, cc'd our Nancy Stiles. And, um, we need, to, we need to get the elected officials, they need to all get together. New Hampshire, Hampton, U.S., whatever the case may be, because the way I look at it, and I think a copy of my letter got generated, but like you're saying, you know, 50% of the total revenues, 2.2 million in parking, you know, 70% of it gets transferred out. Majority of state rooms and meals tax revenue comes from the town of Hampton. But we don't know what amount because they won't give it to us because it's not public information. You know, we'll try to get a bill for that. Well, I'm going to work on a different way to try to get it. And I've sort of vaguely talked to the town manager about that. I like to, in the fall, send out a letter who I've spoken to a slew of business owners already and they're totally willing to do it. Ask for what they pay. What have they paid in 2000, 2016, 2017? I don't, want, I don't want to know your name. I don't want to know your business name. I just want to know if you're a hotel. I want to know if you're a restaurant. Gather the information. They can put it in a box in the town hall, drop it off on a piece of paper. I'm going to take their word for it. I'm going to take their number over what the state number would, you know, what the state would give us if they actually ever give it to us. And we need to start getting this information so that we can relay it to people who are going to do something. Hampton sustains the state of New Hampshire. It's exceptional, financially exceptional. Budget is fin exceptional. There is only 15% 15 of states that operate like that, and New Hampshire is one of them, and they are one of them because of the revenue that comes from this town. Regina, I'm not going to, I'm not cutting you off, but the thing is, we were talking about Coakley well, landfill. I, I know, I know, this kind of ties together. Well, I'm just saying that it's all environmental it's a, yeah. ones. Any, they all are doing the same thing to us, ignoring us. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for what Thank you, you do. Thank, Thank you, you Representative you. Cushing. Can we have the town manager's report? Yeah, I'd just like to say one thing before she leaves, and that is that uh, I'm distressed at how you indicate that the state is not responding. I tackled one of these landfills in New Hampshire in the 1980s. They gave us exactly the same response. Basically, it's our problem. They don't want to know about it. They know nothing. They can't give us any help or any information. And then all of a sudden, they lower the boom. Just out of the blue, no reason, no nothing. Okay, we actually went to the legislature and cut their appropriation off for the following biennium because the chairman of the uh, House Ways and Means and Appropriations Committee happened to be our representative. Yeah. And it took that person coming to the table to threaten not to process their bill for their next two years of appropriation to get them to do something. Mm -hmm. They had all the information, they knew all the answers, mm -hmm. but they wouldn't share it mm -hmm. because it's confidential. Mm -hmm. It's a secret. Mm -hmm. You have to break that, that yep. chain that yep. they're holding on to because they don't want to tell you. Right. I don't know why, but they don't want to. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank Town you. manager's report. Mr. Thank Chairman, you. members of the board. Thank you, Randy. Uh, water main construction on Lafayette Road is progressing forward. The new water main has been installed. It has been flooded and sanitized uh, and tested in part. Uh, they're about to finish the testing, at, at the best of my knowledge. 
Once the sanitation results have been approved, the Aquarian will commence changing the building services over to the new water main. The total project should be slated for completion before Labor Day. So people are going to have some more evening noise and so on and so forth as they cut up the remainder of Lafayette Road. Rexside Road Railroad abutment removal is progressing forward and at least 25%, actually more now, of the stone abutments have been removed. Reconstruction of the drainage and the roadway will commence following the completion of the abutment removals. A number of railroad abutment stones have been placed aside in order to replace the ice pond dam, which is town-owned in the future, subject to appropriate approvals from various agencies. The 2017 paving bids have been opened. They were opened last Thursday. Uh, following analysis and, and the approval process, paving schedules will be developed for late summer and fall for our paving work. That's it, Mr. Chairman. We're good. Try Question? To keep it brief. Nothing? Rusty? All set. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Bean? No, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Griffin? Okay, and under new business, we didn't finish amendment to purchasing policy. What's that? Sir, I thought we were all finished with the purchasing policy. No, no, we had an amendment to it so that you could do um, waivers. Remember, there was no waiver provision on okay. the policy. Yeah, and it, it was in the documents you just signed over there. Yeah. Uh, so, so this gives the board unquestioned authority to waiver if it's in the best interest of the town. Right. And it. Okay. A motion. <laughs> Accept the amendment. Motion to accept the amendment. All in favor? Do we have a second? Yeah, yeah I second. Okay, yep. <laughs> yep. Okay. <laughs> Closing comments. Motion to adjourn at 2152. Uh, second. Second. Regina, all in favor? Unanimous. Thank you very much. Well done, people. It was a long evening.